Creating a winning mindset in health and fitness. Helping you develop a mindset to create positive change, value your health, and enjoy the process. An audiobook written and read by Phil Donnelly. Introduction. The process of improving your health, making positive change, and creating better habits is all underpinned by your mindset. When people want to make positive change with their health and fitness, they often think about two areas of improvement, more exercise and better nutrition. As beneficial as these components are, they are forgetting about a crucial component of self-improvement, growth and success. They are forgetting about their mindset. In my opinion, the reason so many people struggle to improve their physical health is because they make external change before they make internal change. A new diet, going to the gym, drinking less alcohol, these external changes will be short-lived if we haven't created and established internal change first. I questioned the decision of writing this book for a long time. I asked myself, would it be useful? Is it going to help people? And what separates my book to the magnitude of other health and fitness books out there? My goal in writing this book is not to join the I Wrote a Book Club, but to create something that I know will help people with the barriers and problems they experience in their health and fitness journey. As a coach, I've spent the past seven years helping individuals pursue a healthier and happier lifestyle. In doing this, I've experienced the most prevalent issues with one's quest to be healthier, happier, and more successful in their efforts. In my coaching career, I see the same problems, the same issues, and the same mistakes time after time. Following this, I provide nearly the exact same solution and advice multiple times a week. To tell you the truth, everyone struggles with the same components and aspects when trying to adhere to good nutrition and more exercise. Every time a client, friend, family member, or a follower approached me with the same problem, it was another vote in favour of me writing this book. Every vote gave me the certainty, assurance, and push that I needed to write it. So, should someone approach me with a problem in the future, instead of spending hours on end and thousands of words to provide them with the help they need, I can now answer their problem in four words. Listen to my book. Every problem that someone approached me with I could quickly identify that it stemmed from their mindset. Should they struggle to implement good nutrition, a favourable habit, or consistently exercise? These are merely the problems, but they are not the root cause. I can give someone a meal plan and an exercise programme that is completely tailored to them. Problem solved, right? Not exactly. Because the cause still exists. In most cases, nothing changes. Problems will still arise. The root cause and the underlying problem is they do not have the correct mindset to apply the necessary actions in the first place. Despite what you may think, people often don't have a poor relationship with food, or a poor relationship with exercise, but instead, a poor relationship with themselves. They lack clarity, direction, and what their values are. When people improve these aspects of their life, they will be in a much more desirable position to start improving their health. Good nutritional practices, consistent exercise, and conducive habits are all skills. Skills that need to be frequently practiced, adjusted, and assessed. And none of these skills come without the proper mindset first. So, if you are struggling at the moment to create positive change with your health, or you aren't where you want to be with your results, don't be too hard on yourself. You aren't bad at health and fitness. You may just need a little bit more help with your health and fitness mindset. My goal for this book is to contain the necessary solutions, guidance and lessons that so many require on the journey of self-improvement. I want to help you establish a winning mindset that enables you to progress in not only your health and fitness but other aspects of your life too. Many have the aspiring goal to eat better or exercise more yet in order to make long-lasting positive change we need to have the right mindset to do so. Your mindset is the driving force behind your actions and behaviours. In 2021 We are truly spoilt with the options and resources we have in order to improve our health. There is an endless number of resources that offer nutrition education, cooking tutorials, exercise programs, nutrition guides, and much more. In addition, nearly all of this content is accessible at the click of a button, and often for free. So it begs the question, why do people still massively struggle to make change? Why do people still find it so difficult to lose fat? And why is it so hard for people to adhere to better habits in favour of their health? I'll tell you why. Because people's first move is often action. 
and not thought. Don't get me wrong, taking action is essential, but when actions become hard, they don't have the right mindset to persist. In the words of Henry Ford, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably the reason so few engage in it. It is very prevalent that people will undertake a new form of exercise or a new diet plan for a week, maybe two, and after that, it's game over. They lose their sense of purpose and revert back to their previous lifestyle. This is a common occurrence that leaves people feeling defeated and thinking that positive change is just too difficult. This is simply not the case. People are capable of incredible things. They just have to be in the right mindset to unlock their potential to do so. I once heard a very overweight individual publicly say, I just can't lose weight. I've tried everything, every diet, multiple times, and I accept that I'm never going to be skinny. This way of thinking and this type of self-talk is my motive in writing this book. The biggest limiting factor and barrier in someone succeeding is what sits between their ears. Improving your physical health is a physiological process that everybody is capable of doing. But what bridges the gap between wanting and getting is your mindset. Nearly everyone has the same opportunity to improve and progress their health, but you have to take ownership of your choices, actions, and body. Physical improvements do not occur from one workout or one salad. It comes from persistence. It comes from adherence. It comes from consistency. These vital components do not come from a new diet plan or a new exercise routine. They are fabricated from your mindset. I do not want you to undermine or devalue the importance of nutrition and exercise, but I need you to fully understand the relevancy and value this book will have to your goals. Here's my analogy to explain this. Nutrition and exercise information is the money on your debit card, and this book is the debit card itself. You can have all the money you need on your card, just like nutrition and exercise information. You may have the resources, but without the card itself, we cannot access it and therefore benefit from it. Without the right mindset and approach, the information, similarly to the money, will stay idle, unused, and have no value. I hope this book will help you to develop a mindset that breaks down barriers, creates better habits, and enables you to succeed in your health and fitness goals. One of my main objectives for this book is for it to be straight to the point. I want each chapter to be short and sweet, yet have a meaningful impact. I promise this book will be engaging and valuable throughout. However, I want you to understand, I simply would not include something if I did not think it will help you in one way or another. Every thought, concept, or topic in which I cover is an area that I have found people have needed direct help with. You may not need immediate help with all the components of this book right now, but as the saying goes, you are better off to have and not need than to need and not have. Just because you're not struggling right now, it most certainly doesn't mean you won't need guidance and aid in the future. So keep this book close. In an effort to keep each topic punchy and valuable, I've sectioned them into multiple small chapters. This may be unorthodox for a book, but I've done this for two very specific reasons. One, to keep all areas of information suited to the time it requires. I don't want to talk about a topic for an extended period of time when there is simply no need. I want to eliminate the barriers in you listening to this and it being unnecessary long is one. Secondly, should you want to refresh your memory of a certain topic that I cover in this book, I like the idea of you being able to easy locate and re-listen to the exact chapter you need. From experience, I've spent far too long scrolling through chapter timestamps to re-listen to a topic of interest. Lastly, the information, principles and topics that I cover are not heavily cited. I provide references where necessary, yet this book is constructed from my experiences, my knowledge and the lessons I have learnt. I do not want you to think my methodology and thinking are indefinitely right as they are continually changing and improving as time goes by. Listen and learn, but use this book as a guide to create your own success in health and fitness. I merely want to share the information and lessons I have learned that will hopefully help you as much as they have helped me. A strong mind and a healthy body allow me to live a life with so much joy, certainty and confidence. I truly hope this book will help you see the value of your health and mindset so you can start experiencing this too. Why it's harder to improve your health in 2021. In today's day and age, it has never been easier to get something, whether that is information, materials, clothes, books, education, or even a date. 
All of these things are one click away on your phone or closest laptop. The process of getting what we want is minimal. This has us in a very fortunate position in life, yet also an unfortunate position with our health and fitness. When looking at improving our physical fitness and implementing favorable habits, these are aspects of life that will always require lots of time and lots of effort. I think people find this hard to accept because they are so used to getting their wants and desires nearly immediately and at the mere effort of pressing a button. A common problem that many face is the ability to accept the time and sacrifice improving your health costs. People will give it a go, they will give a substandard effort over a short duration and get disheartened when they don't see the output they desire. In 2021, we can lack patience as we have next day delivery on Amazon. We can lack persistence as when something is challenging, we think we're doing it wrong. Acceptance of the process is crucial. There are no shortcuts. There is no fast track, despite what detox diet companies may claim. It comes down to this. Improving your health and body takes lots of time and lots of effort. The sooner you accept this, the more sustainable your efforts will be. In a fast paced world, we are often in a rush to get something or to get somewhere. This mentality in relation to a healthier and happier life will present many problems sooner or later. Trust me, I've seen the unfortunate outcome that people experience from viewing their health and fitness journey as if it were a month long venture. To paraphrase, I've done everything right for three weeks and I'm still not seeing the results I want. I need you to accept the components within this book can take days, weeks, months, and even years to implement. The moment you look at your health as having a finish line is the moment you failed. Improving your health, looking better, and being happier in your own skin is not a race, and there is certainly no finish line. As we move on to the first chapter and all the chapters to follow, I want you to keep this next sentence in the forefront of your mind. Time will pass regardless of what you do, so don't rush the rewarding process of what a healthier life will provide. Chapter one, evaluating your desire to change. One of the first questions I will ask a potential new client is, why do you want to make change? Is it for you or someone else? What has created this desire to change? Was it a moment in your life or a feeling? I ask these questions for one important reason, to understand their desire and reason to make change. In today's society, social media and external voices can drive and inevitably determine what we think we should do. We see people go for morning runs, go to the gym after work, or skip breakfast and think to ourselves, should I be doing that? We are shaped and influenced by what we expose ourselves to, yet this should never be a prerequisite that leads us to making a decision, especially not an important one. Making positive change should be for yourself and a decision made by yourself not because your best friend did it and most certainly not because someone on social media told you to do it. The reason behind creating change will determine if that change will be short-term and insignificant or everlasting and significant. Short-term change and significant change are two very different things. Short-term and unsustainable change often come from a sudden off-the-bat thought or emotion. For instance, telling yourself, I'm going to start drinking more water as someone tells you the importance of drinking water. Tomorrow comes, it's 5 p.m. and your water bottle remains full and untouched. Or you see someone in shape, smiling and eating a salad and think to yourself, I'm going to start eating more salads. Your desire to eat salads quickly diminishes when a donut is put in front of you. You see, your desire to change should never be derived from a short spur of the moment thought. It is not a valid enough reason that will create long lasting and positive results. In addition, you will be left feeling deflated and defeated, thinking it's just too hard. Only significant change will emerge from a deep-rooted and significant desire to improve. Establish your why, establish your motive, and establish your real desire to create change. Task. Pause this audiobook and think about your why. Why do you want to make change? A default answer is to lose fat or to put on muscle. This is the what, not the why. I want you to think why these goals are important, how they will make you feel once accomplished, and how they will positively impact your life. 
It's important to mention, you have to be in the right position to start making change. A pet peeve of mine is when I hear people and coaches say, there is no better time to start than now. I understand where this mentality comes from, to commit yourself and avoid procrastination. However, life is complex and to think everyone is in the right position for change is naive in my opinion. For example, the 25th of December is a poor time to try and make change. When on your holidays is a poor time to try and make change. The month your baby is born is a poor time to try and make change. To mention, these are legitimate times where people have come to me seeking to implement better nutrition and more exercise. At the end of the day, we will prioritize what we value and in life, those values will change. For fitness fanatics and exercise junkies, it's very easy for them to see the value in exercise and good nutrition. So they will say things like, your health should always be a priority, no matter what. But for an individual who is in their initial stages of change, their values are not the same. They don't have the same value for exercise and good nutrition. Therefore, being in the best starting position is highly beneficial in continuing their efforts. To ensure, I'm not saying your health shouldn't be a priority, but it's important to be realistic and aware of your current situation, priorities and mindset. Coaches will wonder and question why clients aren't making progress, yet will be oblivious to the other influential factors in their life. Exercise and dieting are stressors on the body. If you are going through a stage in your life where stress is already high, sleep is poor, and your mind is focused on your highest priority task, adding more stressors will not have the positive outcome you may think. I see this so many times where people are simply not in the right position to start making change, and it becomes a vicious cycle. They try to improve, find it too hard, quit and feel like a failure. In addition, they start to view exercise and better nutrition in a negative light as they can only associate them with one thing, failure. They lose their confidence and improving their health takes a permanent spot on the bottom of their priority list. I'm not saying everything has to be perfect to start because there's never a perfect time. But here's the million dollar question you need to ask yourself. Can I see myself sticking with this for two months, two years, and even for the rest of my life? If the answer is no, make sure you find an approach that you can. Otherwise, you won't get far past the starting line. However, when you start your health and fitness journey, that may be tomorrow, next week, or next month, I hope this book will prevent you from ever having to start again. I hope to enable you to look at your health with a new set of eyes, As a result, your physical health will take a lifelong position at the top of your priority list. Chapter 2. It's hard, so choose your hard. I'm not going to be the person to say, it's easy if you really want it, or you just have to want it more. These so-called motivational tactics are, in my opinion, useless. Consistently eating well is hard consistently exercising is hard and implementing better habits is hard. With this being said, I want you to think about something. Think about the last time you felt successful. Think about the last time you felt fulfilled or accomplished. An exam result, a personal best on an exercise or buying your own house. Now, I want you to think about what you had to do in order to succeed. I can nearly bet the process required time, effort and discipline alongside many other things too. The feeling of success comes from what we earn, not from what is easily given. Now, we don't want things to feel unachievable, but if you don't feel remotely challenged, I would look deeper at the results and return you are going to get from it. To use exercise as an example, without going into the biological processes of muscle hypertrophy, aka building muscle, I'll use a generic, yet in my opinion, very fitting phrase. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. In order to improve and grow, both in the gym and in life, we need a stimulus. We need something that initiates the potential to improve. When challenges present themselves or difficult times prevail, these are opportunities, not setbacks. We will never progress when something is too easy for us. For instance, let's take two football teams, a professional team like Arsenal or Man U, played against the bottom of the barrel Sunday league team. For non-football heads, this is a bad league. 
It's very likely that the pros wouldn't improve or progress over time should they continue playing against the Sunday League team. The level of difficulty simply doesn't challenge them and therefore does not give them the opportunity to progress or improve. It's likely their performance may even decrease. In addition, the pros wouldn't really be jumping for joy when they win. Why? The level of effort and work simply doesn't grant it. Have you ever felt successful and accomplished after eating a pint of ice cream and binge watching Netflix? The likelihood is no, because we can do this with minimal effort and little thought. Just to ensure I don't come across like a drill sergeant coach, there's nothing wrong with some Ben and Jerry's in a movie. Life is for living. My point is, we only feel truly successful and fulfilled when we are challenged. As the saying goes, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Embrace the hardship. It's the very thing that will produce a better, stronger and more resilient you. I want to touch on the title of this chapter, the concept of choosing your hard. In this instance, I'm going to use a relevant example to explain this principle. Before COVID-19, Phil, I just find it so hard to eat well when I have social occasions, weekends away and celebratory events. Prior to COVID, this was a prevalent barrier for individuals in their effort to adhere to good nutrition. Work parties, birthdays, last minute trips or even just a long work week. There was always a reason why people found it hard to stay on track on the weekend. Fast forward eight months and the country is in lockdown. No parties, restaurants are closed and we can't even leave the county. Now, you may hypothesize that nutritional practices should improve as the barriers to good nutrition have been removed. Sounds logical, right? Well, this is simply not the case. Despite having more time, nutrition still wasn't controlled. People drank more alcohol. Less daily structure meant less walking and general activity. Lastly, being housebound resulted in more calories being consumed alongside a poor work-life balance. During COVID-19, Phil, I just find it so hard to eat well when I'm always in the house, have no structure and can't look forward to the weekend. I cannot give statistical evidence for the information above in regards to less activity and more calories consumed, nor can I say this was the case for everyone during the lockdown. However, from being a coach, I was at the receiving end of people's problems following the lockdown. The problems I mentioned above, low activity, more alcohol and more calories consumed. I can't tell you how many messages I received that were on the lines of, Hi Phil, lockdown has really negatively impacted my health. I've gained weight and I'm not happy. Can you help me? In both instances, pre and during the COVID-19 pandemic, people found it difficult. People found it hard and people still struggled to adhere to the actions that favour their health. To conclude, saving money is hard, but so is not having any money at all. Eating well is hard, but so is dealing with the repercussions of poor nutrition. Being organised and punctual is hard but so is being sporadic and unorganized. In every situation, we will find things difficult. We will find things hard, but it's about choosing which hard is most worthwhile and conducive to your overall happiness. I know good nutrition and exercise is hard at times, but trust me, it is one of the most valuable and rewarding things we can do in our short time on this planet. Chapter three, input and output. If you are listening to this book, you want to learn or understand something better, all in an effort to improve. For example, this audiobook is the input. You are putting time and energy into it. What you get from this audiobook is the output. Now, if you were to listen to a few sentences, skip chapters, and listen to it with little concentration, it's fair to hypothesize that you wouldn't get the most out of it. You wouldn't get the desired output. On the other hand, if you were to carefully listen, take notes, and even re-listen to chapters, the probability of you learning, understanding, and applying the information is far higher. The input will dictate the output. This process is apparent in nearly every aspect of life, and especially in health and fitness. It is crucial that you both accept and understand that your results, output, will be highly dependent on your level of investment, input, I'd like you to listen to the next sentence carefully. Only a significant investment into a cause will generate a significant reward. Do not expect sizable rewards with a minimal input. Improvements and progression in your physical health 
is not about perfection. You can't and won't be perfect. No one will. It's about persistence. Persistence with the investment. You will not be able to make all the perfect changes and decisions. But overall, you have to be consistent with good actions. Success inevitably comes down to making more good decisions than bad. Let me assure you, it most certainly doesn't mean you won't make any bad decisions. After all, these bad decisions are the very thing we utilize to make a better decision in the future. Here's a task to assess your input, persistency and conducive actions. Buy a calendar and every day of the week draw three boxes. And yes, this most certainly includes Saturday and Sunday too. These boxes are called input boxes. They are the actions you need to do every day that are in favour of your results, the output. I've just used three boxes as an example. You can use one, five, whatever you want. Every day, your objective is to colour all the input boxes green, which means you've completed all the tasks or actions for that day. This could be a workout, eating three healthy meals, and your daily step count. However, if you have not completed an input box, colour the box red. Do this every day for a full month. Not Monday to Friday, not for two weeks, but consistently for an entire month. At the end of the month, you will have a visual representation of your input. You will clearly see whether your input is significant enough to give merit to your desired results. To mention, the goal is not to have no red boxes. The goal is to have much more green boxes than red. This is a simple yet highly effective method in identifying two things. One, how much effort you are really putting in. And two, the consistency of that effort. What many people fall victim to is thinking a small change will give a large reward. Using the input calendar, for example, they unfortunately think that one green box out of the three will be sufficient enough to generate the outcome they want. For instance, they will complete their daily workout, yet they don't complete their steps and they don't stick to favourable nutrition. They may feel like they are making a huge change, yet if we looked at their calendar at the end of the month, there would be a large collection of reds and an insignificant number of greens. Following an unfavourable or undesired outcome, we can often get frustrated, disheartened and reluctant to accept it. And trust me, I've been there too. This might be a hard pill to swallow, but don't be upset at the results you didn't get from the work you didn't do. For instance, if I don't prepare my food, if I don't complete my training sessions, if I don't hit my weekly steps, and if I overconsume on my calories, I cannot and will not blame the scales for the increase in my weight. My actions have caused this outcome. My input has simply not been congruent with my desired output. It shows a lack of responsibility for your actions should you blame the output. I apologize if I come across like a drill sergeant coach here, but the first step in creating change is awareness and you need to be aware of your input and more specifically, the required input. If you are doing more than you did yesterday, which means one out of three boxes are green instead of none, I applaud you and encourage you to keep going. I do not wish to take away from that newly colored green box. Remember, small wins are everything and you're on the right track. My point is, I want to ensure you are being realistic with your goals. I want to ensure you understand what needs to be done to generate results. And lastly, I want to ensure you are not taking one step forward and two steps back with your health and fitness. Make your effort count. This is why weekly client check-ins are so important from a coaching standpoint. It's an opportunity to assess the level of input clients have made for the week. In the words of the American actor Mike Hawking, you don't get results by focusing on results. You get results by focusing on the actions that produce results. Without assessment of your actions, you can't possibly expect to see the results you want. It's like trying to get a better grade without getting your test results back. You don't know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. To conclude, you've probably heard many times that improving your health and fitness is a lifestyle change, because it really is. You cannot work a part-time job and expect a full-time wage. Just like you can't dabble in a better lifestyle and expect your entire life to change. Commit yourself, jump in and get wet. Just like cold water, it may be a shock at first, but stay in, be persistent, and you will climatize and even start to enjoy it.
Chapter 4. Process Goals and Actionable Tasks In the words of James Clear in his book Atomic Habits, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. In this instance, systems are the processes in which you implement. These processes apply to not only your health and fitness, but also your relationships and work too. I don't want to say that goals are useless. Of course they have their purpose. I see goals as the direction, but more importantly, the systems and processes are for moving in that direction. Directions may change, just like your goals will over time, but your systems and processes need to be a non-variable. Keep trying, keep moving, and keep learning. These are processes that will allow you to succeed. Actions create results, not desire. As I mentioned, goals are important, but I personally feel people place too much value on them. They put them at the top of their priority list. I believe this is one of the first errors when trying to improve one's health and fitness. There are two different types of goals, process goals and outcome goals. Process goals are the achievements and successes that occur throughout your journey of improvement. For instance, sticking to a new habit, hitting your step count every day, or preparing your lunches for the week. Outcome goals are the ones in which you've achieved at the end, like reaching a certain weight or buying a new car. Outcome goals will always seem more glamorous and more significant to most people. I'm here to assure you they are not. There are three key reasons why I opt to focus on process goals over outcome goals, especially when it comes to looking better and improving your health. And that's why you're listening to this, isn't it? Number one. Your commitment to the process will dictate your progress, not your commitment to the goal. I'd like you to listen to that sentence again. In the previous topic, I mentioned that improving your health and body is hard. You'll hit speed bumps and difficulties along the way. If your goal is to eat healthier, when moments of adversity arise, the goal itself will not hold enough weight to push you through tougher times. You need strategies. People often ask, Phil, how do you stay so on track and goal focused? The truth is, I don't. Sure, I have a vision, but I don't focus on a point or a goal that is in the distant future. In my opinion, this simply seems irrelevant to me at this present time. I focus on the process. What can I do to improve today and what immediate actions will make my day more successful? It's this mindset that enables me to stay focused, stay on track, and inevitably will favour my long-term goals as well. A successful day will always feel more doable and manageable than a successful month. Keep this in mind when you're setting goals. The small wins in your day accumulate. Without them, big wins simply don't occur. Never underestimate the power of small wins and process goals. Number two, the second reason why I believe process goals are superior is because there is no end. There is no end point in health and fitness. That's probably why you've never heard anyone say, health and fitness, yeah, I've completed it. It's a never ending journey. Both with your mindset and your body, there is an endless amount of potential for you to improve, learn more and be happier doing it. This is the second reason why I favor process goals over outcome goals. You cannot win. And when you think you can, the journey becomes less and less enjoyable. An all too common measure of success for people is losing weight. They are chasing the wrong thing. Furthermore, they are chasing something that they can't catch. It's like a dog chasing a car, relentless effort and intensity to catch the car. Yet when it finally catches it, it doesn't know what to do with it. In addition, the dog becomes uninterested and chases the next best thing. This is the exact same as chasing a number on the scale. People designate an abundance of time, effort and energy on reaching a number on the scale. Then once they reach their goal weight, surprise, surprise, they aren't happy. What's worse, they then chase something else, aka a new weight, and the vicious cycle continues. In my coaching career, I've had hundreds of consultations with new clients. In these consultations, they tell me their goals, wants and desires. I'll go through a little dialogue that is all too common for my liking. Client, Phil, I'm 70 kilos now and I want to be 60 kilos. Me. Okay, why do you want to lose 10 kilos? They quickly reply, because I will feel happier at this weight. To my next question, I have not once received a valid and rational reply. 
why will it make you happier? They reply with a vague response, because it just will. Believe it or not, I still have yet to meet anyone who is truly happy, content and fulfilled all because they sit at a certain weight. Some may say they are, but honestly, I think this is just a face. Being happy with yourself comes from your mindset, not from what a number says on the scale. Outcome goals can often drive our sense of happiness and basing it on your weight is a very quick way to lose sight of the end goal. We want to look better, not weigh less. We want to feel better, not worse. We want to feel more confident, not scared of the digits on a scale. This is a fitting time to mention Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law states that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Deeming your success on the measurement of weight is the very thing that drives irregular and often obsessive behavior with one's weight. Weight is a measurement, yet people get so fixated on it that it becomes their primary outcome goal. An outcome goal that even if achieved, satisfaction and content are often still absent. Let alone the fact that your weight will massively fluctuate day to day regardless of your effort and interventions. This is why process goals are far more effective in creating opportunities to improve. You get to succeed every day, and in my opinion, that's a pretty great feeling. In the words of author Carol Dweck, becoming is better than being. The process of becoming a better, stronger, and more empowered person will triumph the feeling of being. The process is the very thing that makes you feel alive, so please don't wish it away. Enjoy the journey because your destination will likely change once you reach it. Be in a constant state of becoming, and you'll achieve more than you had ever thought possible. In addition, you'll be pretty damn happy in doing so. Number three. The last reason I'm a big advocate of process goals is due to their anti-fail mechanism. Taking outcome goals, for instance, if you don't hit your goal weight, if you don't get your end of year commission, or if you don't hit your desired body fat target after 10 months, these outcomes can leave people feeling distraught and in a bad mental state. Not necessarily because of this specific outcome, but because of the investment they have made. An input with no output. Although even if we didn't succeed in big outcome goals, it is highly probable we've improved, progressed and developed as a person. However, losses of outcome goals can cloud this. We think, I did all that for nothing, all that effort and work for no reward. Or, all that dieting and sacrifice and I still didn't hit my goal weight. The most successful people in life do not work towards the ending. They work to push the boundaries of success. They utilize process goals to ensure that if they fail at something, the goal never changes. The goal is to keep getting better. Process goals provide an anti-fail mechanism as there is no end game. There is no lose, only learn. This is where a growth mindset comes to play. The individuals who can persist past points of pressure are the individuals who will fulfill their desires and grow as a person. To mention, I'm not telling you to avoid any big goals or opportunities that may fail. I just want you to ensure that you have the right mindset when you're embarking on the journey. Remember, big wins don't occur without lots of small wins first. Aim high, set standards, and create a vision for your success but don't work towards a goal that will inevitably dictate your future participation for that goal. This is a very finite way of living and life is simply too short. To conclude, just remember that your current trajectory is of far greater importance than your current results. Don't look at your current position in life and think that dictates your success. You may not be where you want to be right now, but that's not important. What's important is the commitment to the process. Actionable tasks versus the principle. Following on from process goals, I want to emphasize the role and importance of actionable tasks. People place so much emphasis on the principles of being in better shape or getting healthier, yet they don't put the necessary actions in place to achieve them. A prime example of this is the exhausted phrase, just be in a calorie deficit. Every time you hear this phrase, I want you to refer back to this section in the book. I want to hit home with the importance of actionable tasks that will propel you forward in your health and fitness journey. To mention, 
I am by no means saying this principle is incorrect or untruthful. For an individual looking to lose fat, this is the principle they need to undertake. However, my problem is the lack of efficacy and practical application that this statement provides to the very person who needs to apply it. To use an example, when you are learning to swim, can you remember the process? For me, I was first introduced to water, paddling at knee height depth and getting comfortable with the feeling of being in water. I then went into deeper water, but I could still touch the bottom. I was then put in armbands and I started to learn strokes and foot movement to move forward in the water. Lastly, with consistency and repetition, I was able to swim and tread water with no armbands and I upgraded to the deep section of the pool. Simply put, I was able to move in water without drowning. That's the principle. Using this example for reference, in an effort to learn how to swim and be successful in our efforts, saying move in water and don't drown serves us with little to no relevant and applicable help. The principle has merely been identified. However, this is the exact same as telling someone who is looking to lose weight and be successful in their efforts, just be in a calorie deficit. An individual may understand the principle, but like learning to swim, there has to be an actionable, step-by-step -step process that needs to be followed. Fat loss, improving body image, and creating positive change is such an intricate process. It involves so many external and internal factors that play a role. Behaviours, previous habits, environment, age, values, all of these factors and more play a role in someone's ability to adhere to the principles of eating better and exercising more. The phrase, just eat less and move more, is one of the most naive and narrow-minded things someone could say. Is it any wonder why nearly one-third of the world's population is overweight? It's the equivalent of throwing someone who can't swim into the deep end of the pool and saying, just move your arms more and don't sink. Principles are important, but I want you to reverse engineer your way of thinking when looking at them. Identify your goals and the principles that are required but it is crucial to write down the everyday, actionable tasks that will get you there, just like the strokes in a pool. Chapter 5. The Rate of Progress When looking at the principle of success, many will overvalue the time it takes and undervalue what was done. Here's a task. If I was to show you a picture of your future self, you were in phenomenal shape, the best you've ever been in. You look happy and proud. Would you ask, how long did that take? Or would you ask, what did I have to do in order to look like that? I can't presume everyone would say the latter. But from anecdotal experience, people will be attracted to the time in which something took, rather than the effort and action it required. When looking to improve your physical health, it takes time. This is a basic principle that so many seem to forget. They reduce their calorie consumption and they increase their exercise output and wait for a sudden breakthrough moment of results. This is not the way the human body works. We can control our efforts and our actions, but we can't control time. Focus on the controllable components in your life. In the words of one of the most successful investors and CEOs, Warren Buffett, no matter how great the talent or efforts, some things just take time. You can't produce a baby in a month by getting nine women pregnant. You have to come to terms and accept that your progress will differ to someone else's. It may be faster, it may be slower, but don't compare your chapter 1 to someone else's chapter 10. As much as I like social media and all it's enabled me to do with my business, it can be a dangerous place at times, especially when looking at the concept of progress and results. It's a place where people showcase, market and also sell their results. This following spiel might sound familiar. Sandra achieved these results in just five weeks. You can do it too. Coaches and fitness businesses that do this are just selling a result, but someone else's result. When really, they should be selling a service, they should be selling a process that gets people their own results, not Sandra's. Furthermore, it may take Sandra five weeks to achieve her results, yet there is no calculation and no method of prediction to say it will take five weeks for you too. We are all different. We live different lives in different environments. We have different bodies and we have different definitions of success. It may take you 10 weeks instead of five. It may even take you multiple months. It's important to not only know this, 
but to fully accept it too. Comparing your progress to someone else's will just result in two non-favorable outcomes. One, it will have you constantly working against the clock for results, and this is a non-conducive method in enjoying the process. As I stated in the introduction, time will pass regardless of what you do, so make sure you deeply consider how you're feeling as time passes. Secondly, comparing your progress to someone else's will likely leave you in a worse position than you're currently in. Every minute you think about someone else's progress is a minute spent wasting yours. In addition, you rarely see the conditions that accompany someone's progress and results. You may see a smiley individual that has lost 10 kilos with newly developed abs, but in some cases, it can be at the cost of no social life, a poor relationship with food, and no prospects of what to do next. It's all too common that people give up on their health and fitness journey based on their current progress or results. As stated in the previous chapter, your current actions are of far greater importance than your current results. So put the head down, stick to the plan, and stay in your own lane. The progress lane, that is. Here's a closing piece of advice. You will always work harder in a state of wanting over a state of having. When we have something, we get content and can often neglect the actions and effort that got us to the point of having. Remain in a state of wanting. That's when effort and determination are at their highest. The wolf climbing the hill is always hungrier than the wolf on top of the hill. Chapter 6. Positive Thinking and Capability I want to keep this chapter short and powerful. Achieving results and becoming the best version of yourself can seem daunting and often a long shot. I'd like to take this opportunity to share one of my favourite quotes by Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I find this quote so relevant with our health and fitness aspirations. We are often limited to what we say we can do. To our own fault, we cap our potential. I just can't hit 10,000 steps every day. I could never lose that much body fat. Or, going a month without alcohol is just too hard. I want you to pull yourself up when you use this type of self-talk. Positive self-talk plays such a key role in your confidence and ability to adhere. If your current goal seems very daunting or you've got a long way to go, I want you to start using more positive self-talk. Positive outcomes will never come from a negative mindset. We often lower our standards and set limitations so we don't fail. Although, in my opinion, you've already failed by lowering them in the first place. Here's a harsh truth that you need to hear. When you struggle or fail to do something, in most cases, it's not because it's out of your reach or ability. For example, you are capable of doing 10,000 steps every day. You are capable of hitting your daily protein targets and you are capable of working out three times a week. If you are struggling with one of these or any other problem for that matter, it's likely due to your mindset, your strategies or your habits. It is not because you're not capable of doing it. I want to give you the confidence and assurance that you can push your boundaries of success. But it starts with you. It starts with you being in the right mindset and accepting that you are fully capable. Now, like everything, we want to be realistic. So if you're 40 years old and have never lifted a weight before, squatting 300 kilos might be a long shot. With this being said, it still does not prevent you from being the strongest you've ever been. A beginner squatting a personal best of 50 kilos is just as rewarding and significant as a highly experienced lifter squatting 300 kilos. Why? Because they are both achieving something that is pushing their boundaries and surpassing what they thought they were capable of. Don't limit yourself. Limitations stop you from succeeding in the things that have the greatest return. As I previously mentioned, improving your health is hard, but do not doubt your capability in doing so. If we did all the things we are capable of, we would literally astound ourselves. Thomas Edison Chapter 7. Sacrifice Would you believe me if I said you could eat anything you want? drink anything you want, and do no exercise and still get results? No? Good. Because it would be a lie. Looking better is an achievement. Eating better is an achievement. And being healthier is an achievement. But like most things in life, 
the things worthwhile require sacrifice. Although, unfortunately, people are too reluctant to say this at times, especially some coaches. This is why I think people struggle to accept a level of sacrifice in their quest to look and feel better. A coach's role is to help you get a result. Yet in an effort to get you on board, I sometimes think honesty can be pushed down lower on their priority list. A selling tactic that I unfortunately see on social media is telling people that they can have their cake and eat it too. I see ads that are along the lines of get lean, get fit and still eat all your favourite foods in just eight weeks. Now, I understand why these claims are being made. I understand the science and principle behind calories and how you can include the aforementioned favourite foods and still get results. However, here's the problem. For 35-year-old Mary, who has a poor understanding of nutrition and exercise and is looking to improve, I feel these selling statements draw her into a false sense of security. From this statement, Mary might think, great, that seems pretty easy. I won't have to cut anything out I like to eat. Or, it's only eight weeks, that's very doable. Mary could have multiple problems with her nutritional practices. She may need a significant amount of help in all avenues, from her mindset, habits, and decision-making with nutrition. So her reading a statement like, get lean and get fit while still eating all your favourite foods, is in my opinion, not the selling statement she needs to hear. Mary's dietary enjoyment could be revolved around large quantities of alcohol, and that simply can't continue should she want to improve her health. Therefore, in an effort to improve her health and lose fat, there is a degree of sacrifice required. Personally, I would opt for a selling statement along the lines of, we know the process of eating better and losing fat is hard. That's why we learn everything about you in order to help you become a better and healthier version of yourself. This statement is relevant, truthful, shows empathy and is transparent of how the coach will help. If you are looking to lose fat, improve your health and feel accomplished, a degree of sacrifice is required. As the saying goes, without sacrifice, there is no change. In addition, the sacrifices you make are the very thing that make progress and results that bit sweeter. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but a well-prepared journey is a better one. So I want to prepare you for a health and fitness journey in which you know what to expect. Take on point. I'm not saying you have to flip your entire life upside down. I'm not telling you to start eating broccoli for breakfast, lunch and dinner or start running instead of sleeping to get results. However, if we want to see change, we need to make change, and this change comes in the form of sacrifice. Once these sacrifices begin to pay off, you will no longer see them as sacrifices, more as trade-offs. You will see the benefits and positives from making decisions based on your long-term gain over short-term satisfaction. Should you think you don't need to make any sacrifices or any trade-offs, you will truly struggle to see tangible results and progress in the future. Chapter 8. Moderation I don't like the word moderation, and you probably weren't expecting me to say that, were you? The famous phrase, everything in moderation, is abundant in fitness guides and nutrition books. I want to explain that my dislike for this statement is not because I think it's untrue, more so due to the lack of specificity and relevancy it has to an individual trying to improve their health. Moderation is subjective. Someone's idea or understanding of moderation may be entirely different to someone else's. This is exactly why the principle of moderation has to be established to the person in a given instance. For example, I know what moderation is for me and my goals. That may be a few beers or a few donuts throughout the week. However, it's important to understand that my inclusion of these things are dependent on my activity, choices, calorie intake, and many other things. The damage is in the dose. The number of good actions you make, the number of green boxes ticked, will give merit to how much moderation you can include. Following on from the previous chapter, sacrifice, the level of your sacrifice will often justify how much and how often you can include the finer things, like pizza, beer, and chocolate. For instance, let's take two different guys, Jack and Dan. Every day, Jack works out in the morning, consistently eats three healthy meals, and goes for a two-hour walk. 
Dan, on the other hand, does no scheduled exercise, eats a high calorie and poor quality diet and has a very inactive day. Jack and Dan both have three beers on a Wednesday night and say, everything in moderation. From painting this picture, you may see the problem with the concept of moderation. Jack can include those beers as his lifestyle and other choices justify his consumption. He can have the beers and still achieve his results. However, Dan's lifestyle and current habits mean that the beers in which he consumes in combination with his current choices and actions will negatively impact his health. Telling people everything in moderation, in my opinion, is an unhelpful piece of advice. This is because for many people like Dan do not understand what moderation is. In addition, their so-called moderation is not moderate in the first place. Remember the input calendar. How many greens have you accumulated? Does the number of green boxes and red boxes allow you to include the beers or the chocolate? To conclude, including too much moderation is a common mistake by many. I'm not saying you can't include your favourite biscuits and wine. However, you must first establish what moderation is for you. It is dependent on your daily, weekly and monthly actions as well as your goals. Make sure you're not comparing your moderation to someone else's because in most cases it will be very different. In the past three chapters I've talked about input and output, sacrifice and moderation. I'd like you to think of these as a three-tier system. If you desire an output, the necessary input is required. In an effort to implement the input and succeed in your output, a level of sacrifice is required. Lastly, life is short and is made for living, so include some pizza and have a few beers. With this being said, in order to progress towards your health and fitness goals, you also need to establish what your moderation is when including these things. Chapter 9. The Plateau of Latent Potential People make a few small changes, fail to see a tangible result and decide to stop. In order to make a meaningful difference, habits need to persist long enough to break through this plateau, the plateau of latent potential. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits. This is one of the most impeding factors in someone's journey to improve and look better. Here's a common statement that I get. Phil, I'm making all the correct choices. My input is significant. I'm making sacrifices and I'm still not seeing results. Following this, clients can expect me to make changes, put in new provisions and tamper with the process. I don't do any of these things. I say two words that can have an eye roll response. Keep going. If you recall me saying, small wins accumulate to big wins and small changes accumulate to a big change. People are often in the process of completing small wins and making small changes. They're on the right track and gaining momentum but then they stop. Their impatience gets the better of them and they stop as they haven't seen a big win or a big change just yet. It often takes a certain moment or action for you to recognise or see the big win, to really see the results from all the actions and effort that has occurred up until that point. For example, Rachel wants to lose fat and feel more confident. She consistently exercises and eats well for two months. She hits the two-month mark and doesn't see the changes she was expecting at that point. Although instead of giving up, she persists and carries on with her current efforts. Another month passes and she has an event coming up. On this event, she wears a new dress which is three sizes lower than her previous dress size and gets her makeup done. She feels confident, happy and truly proud of how she looks. It is not the dress or the makeup that has made her feel this way. But sometimes it takes these moments to reflect on your results. It was really from the month of hard work and consistent effort up until that point. Rachel could have hit the two month mark and stopped, but it was critical for her to push past this plateau of latent potential. The meaningful difference in how she looked and felt was not far away, but she would not have succeeded if she didn't persist. A one-off moment will rarely make people successful. It's the continuous work prior that creates the success. However, a one-off moment can very often make you feel successful. It's the moment you put on a smaller dress size. It's the moment you feel comfortable in wearing a bikini. It's the moment you order a pizza with no guilt 
because you're on track with your nutrition. And it's the moment someone tells you you've put on muscle and look great. All of these moments will only occur if the necessary actions and effort were in place prior. You were already successful in the making, but it's a definitive moment that solidifies the feeling of success. These moments may come in a week, maybe 10. If you feel like quitting, keep going. Remember, if it doesn't challenge you, it's unlikely to change you. Break through the plateau of latent potential because the times you feel like quitting are often the times you are closer to success than you think. Patience is bitter, but the fruit is sweet. Aristotle Chapter 10. Motivation I often get asked, Phil, how are you so motivated to eat well? Or, Phil, how are you so motivated to work out all the time? The answer to both of these questions is, I'm not. The truth is, motivation is as much use as a glass hammer. Similar to moderation, the concept of motivation is stamped all over nutrition guides, motivational videos, and fitness magazines. It's no wonder that most people think that motivation is the key to success. And more so, if you're not motivated, something is wrong. As a coach, exercise lover, and meal prep enthusiast, I'm here to tell you this is not the case. And I too am not motivated all the time. In addition, anyone who says they are motivated every second of every day is either lying to sound inspirational or covering up their true feelings and emotions. Stop putting motivation on a pedestal. It is not the key component to success. The reason I do not depend on motivation for being the driving factor behind your actions is because as motivation inevitably decreases, so will your ability to adhere to conducive actions. Do not base a necessary constant on a variable component. In other words, do not allow the important aspects of your life, like health and fitness, to be dependent on something that will likely change, like motivation. In the long run, this will be ineffective as you need to be consistent regardless of the variables. If you wait for a sunny day in the Irish winter to go for a run, you'll do very few runs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, people's motivation to exercise and eat well has been lower than normal. However, should we depend on the principle of motivation to get things done? How does one stay motivated? Have a coach shout at them, make them listen to a motivational talk on YouTube, or just tell a person to be more motivated. These methods are both illogical and unhelpful. If you depend on motivation to do a workout, you'll do very few. If you depend on motivation to eat well, you rarely will. Success is not about being motivated. It's about having the provisions, plans and processes in place to do what needs to be done. If I had two clients with the same goal and one client was highly motivated yet had no systems in place and the other client wasn't all that motivated yet had all the necessary systems in place, I can guarantee the latter client would come out better off. Should you feel like your motivation right now is either high or low, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of your results. What really matters is the systems and habits you have in place that gets the boxes ticked. Now, if you're highly motivated, great. It's only going to benefit you but it is not the be-all and end-all of results. As a coach, the concept of motivating people is a challenging one because a motivating factor often has to be internal and an external voice is often not the solution to the problem. This is very similar to your desire to change. It has to start with you. This is also another reason why process goals are so valuable because every small win and every daily success builds motivation. When motivation is high, great. Use it as additional fuel and take advantage. However, some days you just won't be motivated to do the necessary daily tasks. And that's exactly why you can't solely depend on motivation. You need systems. I'll be covering these systems in the chapters to come. Chapter 11. Excuses. People can often struggle to differentiate excuses and reasons. Both of these will have very different outcomes in the short term and the long term. A reason is based on doing something or not doing something with the long term benefit in mind, whereas excuses are based on doing something or not doing something with short term satisfaction in mind. For example, Gary works in an office and is coming to the end of his workday. 
he looks at the clock and says, I'm not going to go to the gym this evening because if I don't get this work done now, it will prevent me from going to the gym tomorrow and the next day. This is a reason. It holds validity and prioritizes the goal of Gary hitting the gym a certain number of times in the week. The decision of not going to the gym that evening will actually favor Gary in the long run as he'll get to do two gym sessions instead of just one. On the other hand, if Gary says, I'm not going to the gym this evening because it will be late when I finish work and I won't be in the mood. This is an excuse. He is prioritizing immediate satisfaction, going home and relaxing instead of going to the gym and doing what is necessary for his goals. This is also a nice follow-up example of why we shouldn't depend on motivation to adhere to good actions. Life happens, we get tired, we get busy, and the motivation to do something diminishes. Excuses are a double-edged sword. They can damage progress in both the short term and the long term. Taking Gary for example, Gary skipping the gym will result in a missed workout, a lower activity output for that day, and leaving all the benefits of a workout on the table. Improved mood, cognitive function, stress management, muscle gain, and strength development. I could go on. Gary's excuse for not going to the gym has negatively impacted him in the short term. Following this, it will negatively impact him in the long run too. Excuses are rarely a once-off. That's the danger with them. They have a recurring nature. The likelihood of Gary using the same excuse at some point down the line is highly probable. One missed workout, one unplanned meal, or not hitting your daily steps. These things are not going to drastically change how you look in one day. However, if this is repeated, it will have an accumulation effect. I can almost guarantee if you use an excuse once, you will use it again and again and again. This is how excuses can negatively affect you in the long run. We are pretty good at rationalizing and justifying things to ourselves. And this does not help us when it comes to excuses. We try to tell ourselves that the midweek glass of wine is fine or not going for a walk on cold days is okay. The problems really arise when five weeks pass and the idea of a wineless Wednesday seems too difficult or every day seems to be too cold for a walk. We've let ourselves fall victim to these excuses and the excuses themselves become a habit. Be real with yourself. If you find yourself giving excuses, ensure you deal with them immediately. Due to the accumulative nature of excuses, one small excuse can truly be the difference between failure and success. 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. George Washington Chapter 12. Priorities, Choices and Clarity A topic that I think many would presume I'd include in this book is that of discipline. Because let's be honest, how many times have you heard discipline being mentioned in a mindset guide or a success book? I bet a fair few. The reason I'm not going to talk about discipline specifically is because I want to focus on areas and topics that I feel I can practically help you with. Discipline. Noun. The practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior, using punishment to correct disobedience. The very principle of sticking to a set of rules and adhering to behaviors is a highly complex undertaking. It involves one's mindset, previous experiences, current habits, likes and dislikes, environment, and much more. My point is, if someone is struggling with good nutrition, favorable habits, and consistent exercise, what use is it to tell the struggling individual you need to be more disciplined? In my opinion, it's like telling an alcoholic to just drink less or telling a person suffering from depression to cheer up. Would we really expect these things to improve? It is a multifactorial process when improving these issues, just like improving one's discipline. So, instead of giving a big spiel about discipline and how you need it to achieve everything, I'd like to keep things more relevant. I'd like to talk about the very components that will compound together to develop your self-discipline. In this chapter, I will be covering priorities, choices, and clarity. Fully understanding and applying these components will in turn help you become more disciplined. I want to focus on the actions that will create more self-discipline, not self-discipline itself. Priorities. 
In every aspect of life, we will always favour the things that hold the greatest importance to us. For example, family, friends, relationships, memorable moments, and often things that give us immediate satisfaction. We often undertake actions and habits that hold little value to us in the long run. Mindless scrolling on social media, online shopping with no intent to buy anything, or going out and drinking for the sake of it just because it's a Saturday. Just to note, I'm not saying these specific things are bad in nature, but the problem associated with these things is they often negatively impact the things we should be prioritizing. Taking good nutrition and regular exercise, for example, these are two components of life that we know significantly improve our physical and mental health in both the short term and the long term. So why does it regularly fall to the bottom of the priority list for so many? The answer to this is because people are prioritizing fewer valuable components in their day, which in turn affects their ability to prioritize things of greater importance. I, alongside many other fitness professionals, will rarely accept the saying, I don't have time. If it's important to you, you'll get it done. No ifs, no buts, just action. Now, this is not to say that you'll enjoy every second of a priority task, like exercising, or eating well. I know so many people that don't necessarily enjoy exercise or they don't love eating well. Nevertheless, they make it a priority because if they don't, it simply won't get done. If you recall me saying, one of the first steps in making positive change is awareness and you have to be aware of where your health and fitness sits on your priority list. Work, kids, your partner, household commitments and chill time will take up a large percentage of your priorities. It is your responsibility to take control and ensure your health and fitness is a priority. The longer you leave it, the harder it will become to implement it. Trust me, I've seen this a multitude of times and I will be covering this in a later chapter. I'll hit you with a rather harsh piece of advice. If you don't use your time and your energy to stay in control of your health, you run a higher risk of a loved one having to use their time and their energy to deal with the repercussions of your health that you neglected. If your family or partner are a top priority of yours, ensure you are in the position to make them a priority. Fill your own cup before you try to fill someone else's. Being healthier and happier is not just for you. It's also for the people that you spend your life with. Take this into great consideration the next time the decision of watching TV or doing a workout presents itself. Choices. You always get to make your own choices, but you rarely get to choose the consequences of those choices. This is something that I want you to keep in the forefront of your mind in the decision-making process. You have to not only own the daily, weekly and monthly choices you make, but also the outcome of these choices. Referring back to the input and output chapter, the choices you make will inevitably have an outcome but you cannot get annoyed about an undesirable output should you make undesirable choices. Taking ownership is so important in the quest of self-improvement. We have to hold ourselves accountable to our choices and decisions. It's only when we do this we can start identifying the choices and actions that will be more favourable to our health. To note, a bad choice is only a bad choice if you're making it for the second time and it still results in a bad outcome. What I mean by this is, we learn from our mistakes. We learn from the bad choices, as it gives us the opportunity to experience what the wrong choice brought. For example, you choose to take a break and discontinue with your personal trainer. Two months go by and you realize how quickly your health and good habits have slipped as a result. You get in touch with your trainer to get back on track. It's highly likely that you will now value your trainer more, and realize how important it is to have them in your life. In turn, your commitment, investment, and assurance have all increased as a result. One would question, was it a bad decision to take a break? Maybe short term, yes, but in the long run, that so-called bad choice has had a very positive outcome. Now, let's look at this from another perspective. Let's say you return to your trainer after your break and decide to take another break from training. Is this a bad choice? Yes. And why? 
because you have made the choice before and you have experienced the negative effects that came with the break in training. Like I said, a bad choice is only a bad choice if you're making it for a second time or whilst knowing the outcome is unfavorable. Success in your health and fitness goals is not about making a one-off immense positive decision or choice, like building your own home gym or hiring a personal chef for the year. It's about accumulating small conducive choices, day in, day out. These small yet positive choices may seem insignificant, but they are the foundation in which you build on. These choices will become so easy and natural for you that they become a habit. Choosing a protein bar instead of a chocolate bar to increase your protein intake. Walking to your friend's house instead of driving. Or travelling that bit further for a healthier lunch instead of the McDonald's that is conveniently situated beside your office. I could continue with a hundred more examples. There are good choices to be made everywhere. They occur every day, every month and every year. It's your responsibility to make conducive choices. No ifs and no buts. Set yourself a standard. You may not always have a choice to make things better, but you always have a choice not to make things worse. There will be times, environments and social events that will test your capabilities and test your dedication to your goals. Do not use excuses as to why you couldn't make a good decision. Because as you know, if you do that once, you will do it again. Take control. Be aware of the choices and reap the rewards of the abundant good decisions you can make every day. Lastly, remember to give yourself a pat on the back after each good choice you make. These are the small successes that build your confidence in becoming a better version of yourself. Clarity. If you find it hard to stick to good nutrition, consistently exercise, or adhere to better habits, despite what you may think, you probably don't lack discipline you lack clarity. What you need is some clarification and this chapter is to help you do that. The reason I know you don't lack discipline is because I know nearly all of you who are listening to this audiobook has a job, are well educated and are actively learning as you listen to this. All of these things require discipline. Having a job or continuing your education requires an enormous amount of discipline, which you have. The reason you may be struggling right now is not because of discipline, but your lack of clarity. You clearly understand why it's important to work, and you clearly understand why education is important. Yet at the moment, you probably just need some help in clearly understanding your why to exercise and eat well. This links into chapter number one, the importance of understanding your desire to change. As previously mentioned, Many people will half-heartedly partake in an exercise regime and a better diet because they were told to or because they saw someone else doing it. This is often why people struggle with adherence to better health practices. They lack the clarity in why they are doing something, which in turn makes it harder for them to stick to the process. For example, Sarah and Kate both want to lose fat and eat better. Sarah writes on a whiteboard all the reasons why she wants to lose fat. For example, what will it mean to her, how she wants to feel, the person she wants to be, and the processes she needs to undertake to achieve her goal. Sarah has a very strong why. She has a vision and she is clear about what she is doing and why she is doing it. On the other hand, on Kate's whiteboard, she just writes, I want to lose fat and feel better. No explanation, no further clarification and no identified reason as to why her goal is important to her. Both girls have the same goal. It requires the same process, but the adherence levels will be massively different. Sarah knows what she is doing and why she is doing it. Kate doesn't. When Kate struggles with the process of exercising more and eating better, is it any wonder why she feels like she lacks discipline? When you know your why and you know what it means to you, you will rarely struggle with discipline. Task. Write down your why and make it visible every day. Have it written out and visible in your bedroom, kitchen or office. Somewhere you will see it every day. It's an easy yet powerful tool in keeping you focused and reminding you what you're doing and why you're doing it. 
Chapter 13. Fixing Problems with Provisions Throughout your life, you will make mistakes. However, making a mistake is not the problem. Furthermore, you learn from these mistakes. Where the real problems occur is when we do not put any provisions in place to correct the mistakes we make. Identifying a mistake is 50% of the battle. If we do not put the necessary actions and provisions in place, how can we expect that mistake to be corrected or avoided in the future? The principle of putting provisions in place is of great importance when it comes to health and fitness. Here's a few examples of some common mistakes people make with their health and fitness. Not drinking enough water throughout the day. Doing the food shop hungry and as a result buying more high calorie foods for the house. Missing a workout throughout the week because you forgot your gym gear. Ordering a pizza because there's no food in the fridge. And not going for a walk because you just can't get the motivation to get up off the sofa. Making a few of these mistakes from time to time is completely normal and expected. We're human. However, if all you do is identify the problem without thinking how to fix it, you stand little to no chance in correcting these mistakes in the future. American author Louise Hay put this very well. I do not fix problems. I fix my thinking. Then problems fix themselves. Using the same mistakes mentioned above, here are the provisions in which would fix the problem. Problem. Not drinking enough water throughout the day. Provision. Keeping a water bottle with you at all times and setting daily alarms or timestamps to have finished a certain amount of water. Problem. Doing the weekly food shop hungry and as a result, buying more high calorie foods for the house. Provision. Ensuring you have just eaten a good quality and filling meal prior to doing the food shop. Lower hunger levels will mean high calorie foods won't tempt you as much. Problem. Missing a workout throughout the week because you forgot your gym bag. Provision. Leave your packed gym bag beside the front door so you have a visual cue to remember it. Better yet, put your gym bag in the car the night before. Problem. Ordering a pizza because there's no food in the fridge. Provision. Write a list of all the dinners you are going to cook for the week. Accompanying this, make sure the necessary ingredients have been bought for the shop in order to do so. Problem. Not going for your daily walk because you just can't get the motivation to get up off the sofa. Provision. Once you get home from work, don't sit down. Get changed, put your runners on and walk straight out the door. This is called owning the decisive moment. I will be covering this in more detail later on. If you know the sofa is the determining factor in doing a walk or not, avoid it. Don't allow yourself to lower your standards or worse, create an excuse as to why you couldn't go for a walk. Blaming the sofa is not a route you want to take. The examples I provided above seem so simple, right? They seem so basic, yet it is alarming how many people don't put any provisions in place. They have a problem, do nothing about it, and then get annoyed, frustrated, or feel hard done by when it reoccurs. In the famous words of Albert Einstein, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. The provisions have to be specific. There has to be a strategy and an actionable process. Some people's provisions are simply too broad to create positive change. For instance, if you don't drink enough water, telling yourself, I need to drink more water. This is not a provision, as there is no process in place. There is no call to action. In life, we do what is easy for us. We take the path of least resistance. If it's easier to not drink water, despite how important it is, we simply won't do it. To conclude, ask yourself this. Are you making progress? And are you happy with your current situation? If yes, well done and keep going. However, if no, ask yourself why. It's likely that you're experiencing problems and barriers that prevent you from progressing. Those barriers will stay in your way. They will be an indefinite roadblock in your journey to self-improvement, should you not remove them. Looking at the barrier is not enough. Nothing will happen by merely identifying that it's there. In an effort to move them and progress, you have to create an actionable plan 
as to how you're going to move them. The more barriers you remove, the more experience you will gain and the more competent you'll become in the never-ending journey of improvement and success. Chapter 14. Momentum. Positive actions fuel more positive actions and negative actions fuel more negative actions. A great example of this is when we eat one cookie and think, sure, I might as well finish the pack now. A minor non-conducive action has been the fuel to create more damage. On the other hand, when we successfully adhere to positive actions, we often persist. We feel more obliged to continue based on the rewards from our efforts. We gain momentum. To clarify this, would you look in the mirror, see progress, feel amazing, and then be undetermined to continue? Of course you wouldn't. Once you see results, once you see progress, it becomes addictive. Whereas if you were to look in the mirror, see little change, and feel rather disappointed about yourself, it's likely you would question your efforts and potentially give up. In both cases, your current state will fuel the actions to come. One good action or habit is not just relevant to that present time, but it can often dictate your future actions and mindset too. Capitalize on your progress and use the momentum you have gained. The definition of momentum is the strength or force that allows something to continue or to grow stronger or faster as time passes. Broadly using this definition in the context of health and fitness, the greater your efforts and the stronger your actions will enable you to continue and progress. I've coined a phrase called AFWs. This stands for alcohol-free weekends. The reason I feel confident to mention this now is because I have already talked about moderation and sacrifice. When I mention the concept of AFWs, I often get a defensive reply along the lines of, but Phil, you can still include alcohol and get results, or everything in moderation, Phil. Of course I know this, but as I stated in the above chapters, too many run at the first sight of sacrifice, and too many exhaust the concept of moderation. In an effort not to sound too contradicting with chapter 4, the rate of progress, I think you would be amazingly surprised at the improvements and progress you can make from two AFWs, 14 days of positive actions. Let me get to the point, because this chapter is not about alcohol-free weekends. It's about momentum. In a bid to look better and improve your health, one will often apply themselves and give five days of solid effort, all to completely let go on the weekend. They consume their habitual weekend alcohol feel a bit hungover and feel undetermined for their week ahead. Is it any wonder why people dislike Mondays? Tired from the weekend, feeling crappy and having to get back on the so-called health buzz. A piece of advice. Eat well, exercise regularly and stick to good habits for seven days straight. Not Monday to Friday, but from Monday to Sunday. I don't make many promises, but I promise you will feel accomplished, fresh and you'll enter the following week with incredible momentum. It's not about specifically cutting out alcohol, yet it's often the catalyst in people going off track and having a non-favourable weekend. Not only do you feel great from having a successful and productive weekend, but you also feel more driven and eager to continue feeling that way. That's what momentum does. It uses good actions as fuel for more good actions. The main difficulty with establishing momentum is the startup period. It does take time to gain some positive force behind you. This is where the importance of persistence and patience lies. For instance, when we initially start exercising, the start of your run or workout can be pretty tough. Yet after a few minutes, you get into it and it feels easier. Also, when cleaning your room, it seems like a monumental task. Yet as you've tidied a few things, your room starts to take shape and you're cleaning without much thought. After the startup period, you've gained some momentum and you start to feel much more successful and even start to enjoy it. You know the result it will have and better yet, it'll often lead to more positive actions. After your workout, you rarely want a Domino's pizza. You want good food that will nourish you and further benefit you. This is the power of momentum at first hand. Chapter 15 Boredom. Despite what you may think, 
This is not a chapter in which I talk about the tactics to stay constantly entertained. This can sometimes be the very thing that stunts progress and improvement. By no means am I saying it's good to be bored. As stated by Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher, the two enemies of human happiness are pain and boredom. However, people can lack patience and persistence with the process of good nutrition and exercise. At the detriment to themselves, people will adhere to something for a few weeks and then start tampering with the process to avoid boredom and repetitiveness. As I previously mentioned, there is a necessary input for a desired output. For instance, footballers kick a ball thousands of times. Swimmers reach their hand for a new stroke of water thousands of times. Dart players flick a dart at the board thousands of times. And golf players swing a golf club thousands of times. The same action, the same process, time after time, for years. Sure, they could turn around and say, I'm bored of doing the same thing. But in order to improve and progress, repetition is required. Consistent repetition is required. The enjoyment of these tasks come from the developments of their practice. This is vital to understand when looking at the processes of eating better and exercising more. People can often say they're getting bored of the same food. There are two things that you need to consider when this statement or thought arises. One, there is an endless number of cookbooks, food magazines, healthy meal guides, low calorie recipes and online cooking tutorials. You rarely have the right to say you are bored if you are choosing not to learn more and improve. Our ability to eat well is massively dependent on what we have access to and we are so fortunate that we have an abundance of resources all at the click of a button labelled home delivery. Secondly, if your so-called boredom is due to cooking your own meals and eating whole foods instead of eating takeaways that are triple fried and marinated in butter, you're failing to see the necessary input. I jokingly say to my clients, losing fat would be very easy if all we had to do was eat dairy milk chocolate and drink alcohol. But unfortunately, this isn't the case. 80% of your daily meals will and should consist of the similar basic food groups. This is the necessary input. If every week you order multiple takeaways and switch your dinner with a convenient snack, this may put your boredom at bay momentarily. But as a result, it will steer you off the course from the necessary process. I see this time and time again. If you're failing to abide to good nutrition because you're bored, you're either A, not improving your cooking abilities and nutrition skills, or B, you're failing to accept that you have to eat a certain way for the desired output. If you want to look and feel better in your body, this is not going to come from only one well-composed meal every day. I'm not saying you should be eating chicken, broccoli and rice three times a day. What I am saying is that there's a level of acceptance and sacrifice required. And this may mean including more meals along the lines of chicken, broccoli and rice. You have to get good at the boring stuff. Cooking meals that are mindful of calories, doing an extra cardio session, drinking your water. These things are boring at times, but they need to be done and done consistently. In order to succeed in anything in life, we have to be consistent. An all too common thing that I see people doing is changing their diet every month or switching their exercises in the gym every second week. There is value in novelty. And when people see something new, they jump at the chance at buying it or implementing it. This does people no good in terms of getting results. This is apparent when we have that one friend who is always on a new diet. But for this exact reason, nothing changes and little progress is ever made. Without consistency, it's near impossible to know what works and what doesn't. It sounds ridiculous, but sometimes being consistent with the wrong thing is actually more beneficial than being inconsistent with the right thing, because at least you know the input that gave you a specific output. Even if it wasn't the desired one, people can question their lack of returns from their efforts, yet their efforts are continually being changed. If you want to get better at pull-ups, you need to practice doing pull-ups. If you want to get better at writing, you need to practice and write more. And if you want to eat better, you need to practice implementing better nutritional practices. A skill doesn't just happen. It requires work, repetition and consistency. 
When someone wants to improve their physical appearance but says, I'm getting bored of eating like this or I'm getting bored of these exercises. It's like a cyclist saying they're bored of pedaling a bike when they want to win the Tour de France. There is an input that must be met in order to achieve the output. With our health and fitness, this entails a well-constructed plate of food three to four times a day and performing the same exercises for thousands of reps. Don't change the game plan for the sake of making it more entertaining or because a new trend has come about. Enjoyment is important, but enjoyment will quickly diminish if you're not achieving the very things you set out to achieve in the first place. If I chose to watch paint dry, do you think I would get bored? Of course I would, because it has no valuable result and I can't progress or improve my skills of watching paint dry. Therefore, my enjoyment is quickly capped. However, this is not the case at all with nutrition or exercise. There is always room for improvement and progression. Chapter 16. Feeding into Negativity I think it's fair to say 2020 was a fairly rough year for us all. A global pandemic that has changed our sense of normal. People passed away from the virus. People lost their jobs. Businesses closed down and people's physical and mental health weren't in the best state. You could certainly say it wasn't the most positive year. This is where I'd like to touch on the concept of a growth and a fixed mindset. In a negative situation, it is so easy to amplify your emotions and feel worse. We're all guilty of it. I am by no means saying it's easy to think positively in negative situations. It's not a quick fix, and saying cheer up or just think about the positives isn't the most effective strategy in helping. With this being said, we have to consider if we are actually making the situation worse by feeding into the pre-existing negative state. If you recall from chapter 2, when difficult times prevail, they offer us with the opportunity to improve. Remember, Man U or Arsenal will never improve playing against the Sunday League team. To provide a better context, I'm going to use myself as an example. I achieved a lifetime dream of building and opening my very own personal training facility on the 1st of October 2020. I had my personal training studio open for two short weeks for it then to be closed for six weeks due to the second lockdown. I received an abundance of messages saying, Phil, I'm so sorry for what's happened to you in the studio. As nice as these messages were, I simply didn't think I was hard done by. I didn't choose to focus on what the lockdown had stopped me doing. Instead, what it allowed me to do and how grateful I was for that. I felt so fortunate to have opened the studio just before the lockdown happened. I thought to myself, I now have my own place to train and exercise in over the next six weeks. Lastly, I felt so grateful that I would have the studio ready and waiting for the return of all my clients in six weeks. There were so many positives. It was just a matter of me identifying them. I think some people were expecting me to curse the government for the decision that they made, because lots of people did. Although, what use would have that been? Would it make me feel better? Would it reopen my studio doors? And would it make the situation a more positive one? The answer to all of these questions is a resounding no. Again, this way of thinking doesn't come naturally to everyone, and it's not easy. However, the first step in thinking more positively and developing a growth mindset is thinking and reflection, not retaliation and thoughtless action. Following a negative circumstance, it's all too common for people to lash out, talk without thought, and act without consideration of the consequences. After my studio doors were uncontrollably closed, I could have ranted about the government on their lockdown procedures. I could have taken to social media and complained about the current predicament and situation. And I could have sat at home and bathed in my negative thoughts and emotions. But I didn't, because that wouldn't have had any benefit to me or my clients. Here's what I did do. I used the time to finish all the finishing touches in my studio. I did my taxes. I organized all my paperwork. I enjoyed longer workouts. I uploaded more content. I refined all my work systems to be more productive when returning to work. I took some more fill time and enjoyed life at a slower pace. I read more books. I raised awareness of my studio, which resulted in a magnitude of new client signups. And the most important thing, I wrote this book. 
which has been on my to-do list for a very long time. I think you can gather that I benefited immensely from all of the above. The time I lost working was the time I gained to improve everything that needed to be upgraded. I can honestly say I've never benefited so much from a so-called negative situation. So, what can you take from this that will help you with your health, your fitness, and your mindset? You may not be in control of what happens to you, but you are always in control of how you respond and deal with it. If you give yourself the opportunity to feed into negativity, you'll come out worse than you went in. Here's an instance of how your mindset will dictate your actions that follow a negative situation. You've gained some weight. Positive thinking. It's only a bit of weight, and thankfully, I have a healthy, able body that will allow me to lose the weight. Negative thinking. Well, I've already gained weight, I feel crap, so this pizza can't make me feel much worse. It's a vicious cycle. We try to deal with our negative state with the very things that will just further negatively impact us. Remember, positive actions will only materialize following positive thoughts. A fixed mindset will focus on what you can't do rather than what you can do. The pessimistic side will always prevail. There are certain moments in life where I truly realize how fortunate I am. I can't necessarily tell you to be grateful as this sense of gratitude has to be self-derived. However, I will share the things that keep me in a positive state and feeling so fortunate in life. It's funny. I don't feel fortunate for the car I have, the house I live in, or even my new personal training studio. These things, of course, bring me so much joy and I am eternally grateful for them. Yet my sense of fortune come from things far more basic. A charity called Deborah works with people suffering from a rare skin condition called EB, epidermolosis bullosa. It's a genetic condition that essentially causes the skin to blister, break and tear at the slightest touch or bit of friction. I remember when I was 15 and I watched a documentary following an individual suffering from this awful condition. Watching that documentary has played a pivotal role in the mindset I have today. Watching this documentary made me realize how easy I had it, how fortunate I was, and how easily I could do all of the things that the people in this documentary simply couldn't. Pretty deep for a 15 year old, right? Now, before you start thinking, but Phil, all problems are relative. I agree with this, to an extent. I hope up until this point in the book, you've agreed with most things I've said, but I'm sorry if this next bit rubs you up the wrong way. I saw these children going through immense pain from putting their clothes on, taking a bath, and depending on the severity of their condition, walking was just too painful. With all this, the children were still able to laugh, smile, and be grateful for life. I'm sorry, but your so-called relative problem of not getting your usual Saturday booking in your favorite restaurant quickly becomes redundant in my eyes. You may think this example of not getting a booking is ridiculous, but it's alarming how much this would affect people's mood, how much they would feed into negativity. You can hold your it's all relative card close to your chest. That's okay. Honestly, you don't have to agree with me here. But a common question I get asked is, Phil, how do you stay so positive? For me, knowing that I can walk outside, take a shower pain-free, do exercise without my skin tearing and bleeding, the things I value become pretty simple. I know it's a graphic example, but I will forever have gratitude and appreciation for the things I'm able to do that some people would only dream of. The small things in life are really the big things, yet these are the first things we forget about when we have a negative mindset. Things like going for a walk, going to the gym, cooking good food and being active. They may seem like a chore, time consuming and some of life's biggest inconveniences at times. But honestly, the freedom of going for a walk is a freedom that many don't experience. Just keep this in mind before you start cursing the idea of having to go out for your daily walk. This part of the book isn't meant to pull on your heartstrings. What it is meant to do is make you think, when you gain a few pounds, 
when you're not exactly where you want to be with how you look, or you've had a bad week of nutrition, are you going to use this as fuel to improve or an anchor to hold you back? Are you going to capitalize on all the positives in your life? Or are you going to allow the negatives to dictate your future decisions? Are you going to feed into negativity or prevail with positivity? Whatever the situation or circumstance, there are always positives and negatives. You choose where your focus lies. You're in a great starting position in life and never forget that. Chapter 17. Losing the value of success by normalization. The principle of losing the value of success is an area that I see many people fall victim to. Your current state of happiness and success often becomes the norm, and this can present problems with your ability to feel fulfilled. As I've stated throughout this book, the journey of self-improvement and looking better is a continuous one. However, always reflect and think about your current success and what you've accomplished. This is a simple task, yet it goes amiss for many people. For instance, a client comes to me and their goal is to lose 10 pounds and feel better about themselves. Two months pass and they've achieved their goal of losing 10 pounds and to feel better. The very nature of self-improvement and results will always have the client wanting more, to progress more, to feel even better, and even to establish new goals. This is great, but it is also crucial for the client to sit back, reflect, and really digest the success and accomplishments made up until that point. Remember, the more momentum you gain, the better, and this momentum comes from the acknowledgements of your current successes. Here's an example of this. I've had clients lose 20 plus pounds, yet when they don't lose weight for one week, they feel truly disheartened and it impacts their mood, energy, and mental state. Here's my reply to this. If three months ago I told you that you'd be 20 pounds lighter, you would tell me how amazing you would feel. Once people reach a goal, they can forget about the significance of that success in the first place. It becomes a norm. We often focus on the present and the future, yet rarely take our past emotions and goals into consideration. Sometimes when we've achieved something, the value of the current accomplishment diminishes as we can be so fixated on what's next. I've been so guilty of this in the past. Every day, I walk into my new personal training studio and think how grateful I am for it, how happy it makes me, what it provides, and more importantly, I think about how a younger Phil would feel if he knew this was in his future. This is yet again why process goals are so valuable, because you can win and feel successful every day, but you have to acknowledge them. You know that every process goal makes you better and makes you feel more accomplished. Furthermore, when you experience these new improvements every day, it won't become a norm and you will appreciate the success for everything it is. Complacency and comfort when success stops. The principles of self-improvement and success come from consistency, sacrifice, and from the necessary effort and work. Should these aspects become absent, self-improvement and success will begin to plateau or even regress. Using one of the most prevalent examples of weight regain, when someone has succeeded in their goal to lose fat and feel better, they have illustrated all the correct actions and protocols to do so. One, they've stayed in a consistent calorie deficit, demonstrating desire and effort. Two, They have sacrificed their short-term wants for their long-term goal of losing fat. Three, their input calendar has a significant number of green boxes that represent conducive actions. Four, the red boxes in their calendar, which represent mistakes and failures, have been learnt from. Five, lastly, they were patient and persistent with the process. This is truly a recipe for success. Unfortunately, This success can be short-lived for some should they become complacent and comfortable. Remember, it is important to recognize and value the success you have made, but it's essential to continue with your efforts. The all-too-common process of weight regain can occur because of this. The individual has stopped doing the necessary work 
in order for them to maintain their weight or progress and lose more. They start to let their nutrition slip. The things they sacrificed are being reintroduced. Their input calendar starts to accumulate more red boxes than green. And the mistakes they make are not corrected, but repeated, as there is no provisions put in place. Nothing grows in a comfort zone, and nothing improves in a state of complacency. We generate the best results during the wanting phase, and we generate most problems during the having phase. This occurs because we've stopped the work, efforts, and actions that have gotten us to the having phase. Keep your habits, behaviours, and mentality in the wanting phase. That's when we do our best work, and that's when ongoing success will occur. To conclude, I want to clarify the desired mindset with success. When you feel successful, remember that success was once a goal for you, maybe a monumental goal. So don't let the value decrease. Don't let it become the norm. Don't let your next goal inhibit your ability to see what you've accomplished thus far. It's this very recognition that will make you feel successful along the never-ending journey of success. It's important to look straight and stay focused in the direction you're going. But don't forget to take a second and look back to see how far you've come. I would suggest taking a picture to remember those moments. A mental picture, that is. Secondly, we want to ensure we are continually improving and moving forward in our journey. As I said, take a moment and appreciate where you are. But don't forget about what got you there. The time it took and the effort it required. You'll end up stationary, or even worse, in reverse, should you forget these things. Chapter 18. Choosing your battles and looking at the big picture. Do you sit back and think about what you're putting your energy into? Do you think about what aspects of life you designate the most amount of effort to? If you don't, I would strongly recommend you start. In all aspects of life, we want to favour and focus on the things that will have the greatest reward and benefit to us. This should be no different when looking at the components that improve our body and mental health. However, it's common for people to forget this. They lose sight of the bigger picture and can focus on the insignificant components that have a small contribution to the grand scheme of their health. People will often spread themselves too thin and try to undertake too many things. This can have a negative impact in two aspects. One, they are putting too much effort into things with a small reward. Two, as a result of number one, they don't have enough time and energy to focus on the bigger battles. These bigger battles will inevitably lead to the bigger successes. In an effort to improve your health and look better, there is a multitude of controllable factors that will have a huge positive impact on your health. A nutrition principle that I always preach is, consistency with the basics will generate far greater results than inconsistency with the specifics. To name a few examples, before you worry about the chemicals and sweeteners that are in a can of Coke Zero, control the number of calories you consume on a daily basis. Before you start implementing a highly specific and detailed training program, make sure you're consistent with actually going to the gym first. Before you start to fixate on the difference between brown rice and white rice, stop drinking three bottles of wine every weekend. Before you double your food bill from purchasing all organic food, make sure you're hitting your daily protein targets. Before you start reducing your calorie intake from illogical methods, start increasing your daily activity and exercise. And please, before you start implementing so-called energy-boosting foods and supplements, prioritise your sleep. I could give an endless number of examples of how people prioritise the wrong thing. They waste their energy on small battles that leave them in no better position. Choose your battles wisely and you'll win the war. Always look at the big picture and assess what you're putting your energy and effort into. Doing less with better quality, intent and consistency will be far more beneficial than doing more with poor quality, substandard effort and little consistency. Please keep this in mind before you implement any new diet or a fancy exercise program.
If you're on the quest for a perfect diet, I'm sorry to say, you'll be forever unsuccessful. Our nutrition, physical health, and mental health will always have aspects that we can improve. However, if you lose sight of the basic components that generate 90% of results, you're going to be forever fighting battles. To provide an example of this is the meat eater versus vegetarian debate. If you think I'm going to enter the debate, dis vegetarians and say meat is essential, I'm sorry to disappoint. I won't be doing any of this. The research and findings of nutrition literature is forever evolving. I'm in no position to say do or don't or what's right and what's wrong. This is merely my view and opinion on where I believe people are going wrong. One of the main principles that are said to differentiate vegetarian diets and omnivorous diets is one being healthier than the other. I personally think this is where the problem arises. People are not only fighting an insignificant battle, but the wrong one too. Instead of active and healthy vegetarians battling with other active and healthy meat eaters, we should be using that energy, effort and education to fight a much bigger war, to help the millions of individuals suffering from obesity, metabolic syndromes, cardiovascular diseases and body image depression. Firstly, if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, I applaud you. If you feel better both morally and physically and it gets you the results you desire, do your thing and don't let anyone stop you in your journey to success, especially me. I will never tell anyone they should eat a certain way because after all, I'm a personal trainer, not a nutritionist. But more importantly, it's not up to me to decide what approach of eating someone should take. With this being said, from over seven years of coaching, hundreds of consultations, and probably thousands of conversations, people come to me presenting the same problems. They are overweight, they have too much body fat, they have a poor understanding of nutrition, they do no exercise, they live a sedentary life, they eat too many calories every day, they often drink too much alcohol, they have poor habits, and they don't prioritize their sleep. When looking at these problems, the inclusion or exclusion of meat is pretty low on my priority list in order to help them. Making a person eat meat, or to the contrary, making them go vegan or vegetarian, should not be the focal point when trying to improve their presenting problems. The goal should be to focus on their very basic and fundamental health markers. This is the battle that should be chosen. Referring back to chapter 3, input and output. Taking the above problems for example, if someone tells me they struggle to do any exercise, I'm not going to tell them they need to go vegetarian. If someone is overeating on their calories, I'm not going to tell them they need to eat more meat. Both of these inputs will not help or aid in generating the desired output of walking more or eating less calories. Yet when people look to improve their health, omnivores often preach the importance of meat and vegetarians will bash meat and say it's unhealthy. I'm really not surprised that people go vegetarian from watching one Netflix documentary or going carnivore because their friend told them it's the key to gains. In both instances, they have heard all the positives of each eating approach with little consideration if it's actually relevant to their presenting health issues. I'm not here to preach what eating approach is better. I'm here to preach that whatever your approach is, it's essential that you understand why you're doing something from a nutritional standpoint. Are you choosing the right battle? And is that battle going to help you in the specific health problems that you face? If you wish to go vegan or vegetarian for ethical reasons, that's a really good reason. If you wish to go vegan or vegetarian, as it's easier for you to stay on track with your calories, that's a really good reason. If you wish to go vegan or vegetarian for financial reasons, that's a really good reason. Meat is expensive. And if you wish to go vegan or vegetarian for convenience and palatability reasons, they are really good reasons. But I'm sorry, I personally don't agree with an individual going vegan or vegetarian purely for its perceived health benefits. Not because vegan or vegetarian is a lesser or unsubstantial way of eating. Not at all. We should all be taking a leaf out of their book and prioritizing more vegetables and whole foods. More so for the reason that a huge percentage of the population 
can drastically improve the essential components to a healthier life before flipping their dietary practices upside down. I firmly believe in staying in my own lane as an educator. I do not possess the required information or knowledge to say what the best diet is or what eating approach to take. But I most certainly have the experience to know what people need help with when it comes to the fundamentals of their health. This is because I've been at the receiving end of it. For example, I've had a client come in to me who didn't understand what a calorie was. They've never done any prescribed exercise in 30 years. They sleep four hours a night from a highly stressful job and live off buttered rolls and coffee. Do you really think me telling this person to go vegan, vegetarian, omnivore or carnivore is the help they need? Is that really the battle they need to fight right now? So how does this example link into this chapter? In a bid for someone to improve their health, lose fat and feel better, they may cut out meat or include it. But this rarely changes much in the grand scheme of results for so many people. They're choosing the wrong battle. The inclusion or exclusion of meat is not the necessary action for their desired output. It is not the primary reason why they look and feel the way they do. From experience, the reason someone is overweight or steadily accumulating weight is because they aren't controlling their calorie intake. They aren't implementing regular exercise. They aren't adhering to good habits and choices. They aren't staying consistent with the necessary actions to lose fat. They don't possess the correct mindset in order to successfully implement positive change. And their environment may not aid in their quest to improve their health. They are not overweight and unhealthy solely because they do or don't eat meat. Instead, it's due to the accumulation of all the aforementioned components above. Should they choose to cut out meat or include it, they are simply choosing the wrong battle in my opinion. Remember one of the first lines in this chapter, we want to favour and focus on the things that will have the greatest reward and benefit to us. All of the essential actions and fundamental factors that are required to improve our health and feel better are apparent in all approaches of nutrition. We all need sleep. We all need exercise. We all need a specific number of calories. We all need to manage stress. We all need protein. We all need lots of vegetables and whole foods. But these are commonly lacking in both vegans, vegetarians and omnivores. There are an abundance of benefits to a plant-based diet, but these benefits become quickly redundant if you overeat, live a sedentary life, eat low protein and never exercise. This is the same for every diet and I don't think anyone would disagree. Here's an unfortunate reality and something that I've heard too many times for my liking. Phil, do you know how bad those zero calorie energy drinks are for you? There's nothing but chemicals in them. All while said person sniffs lines of cocaine every weekend and washes it down with 10 double vodka Red Bulls. No one is perfect in their choices, but make sure you sit back, reflect and question your choices before judging someone else's. Your health and physical appearance will be dictated by the percentage of your actions which are in favour of your goals. Should you adhere to 90% of components that make up a healthy lifestyle, you're doing very well in your efforts. So in the grand scheme of things, don't stress over an occasional energy drink or a processed ready meal. It's ironic. From experience, the very people who are in a poorer state of health will be the ones to comment and judge the people that are in a better state of health. Taking myself, for example, I feel I'm doing pretty well on the health side of things in my life. I weight train five times a week. I stay in line with my nutritional requirements. I hit my protein targets. I eat my daily fruit and vegetables. I manage my alcohol intake. I don't do any recreational drugs. I hit my daily step count. I prioritize my sleep. My blood and health markers are good. And I take great care of my mental health. Sounds pretty thorough, right? Well, it doesn't stop an overweight individual who does zero exercise and drinks 10 plus units of alcohol every weekend to tell me that frozen vegetables are bad for me and they are inferior to fresh vegetables. It begs the question, are frozen vegetables versus fresh vegetables really the battle this person needs to be fighting? Chapter 19. Identity. Are you holding on to body fat right now? Well, I certainly hope you are. 
Otherwise, something would be very wrong. Having body fat can often be deemed or seen as bad, yet it's actually essential for a healthy, happy and productive life. Now, of course it's not favourable to have excessive amounts of body fat. This can negatively impact our physical and mental health. However, I feel people fall victim to using ill-fitting language when talking about the topic of body fat. It's vital you listen to this next sentence carefully. Just because you have body fat does not mean you need to lose body fat. As I mentioned, having a certain amount of body fat is very normal and in my opinion, necessary for living your best life. So please don't compare it to the devil and please stop groping and grabbing your skin and saying, this needs to go. Of course we can be in a position to lose some belly fat and reduce the love handles, but you're human. You're made of flesh, skin and essential body fat. You're not made of metal. Stop thinking something is terribly wrong when you're able to grab a roll of your flesh. Unless you're an unhealthy body fat percentage, and I mean truly unhealthy, that grabbable section on your belly, you'll always have that. So stop thinking something is wrong. One of the most common phrases I hear when people possess body fat is, I am fat, or he is fat, or she is fat. This use of language can have the most damaging effect on one's mental health, but also their ability to improve. Let me explain as to why with an example. When you have a flu, you say, I have the flu. You don't say, I am a flu. Why? Because the flu doesn't define what you are. You may have it, but exactly like body fat, you can get rid of it. It's not permanent. Losing body fat may take longer than getting over the flu, but you get my point. People tell themselves they are fat. They are pairing fat with their identity. They are essentially saying it's who they are. Is it any wonder why people holding on to excess body fat that use this type of self-talk can lack self-esteem, confidence and the ability to lose fat? It's very hard to lose a part of your identity. So by a person defining themselves as fat and always being fat, it makes it incredibly hard to be in a mindset to think that making change is possible. I've got some great news about fat. You can lose it. And don't be in a mindset that makes you think otherwise. I've tried not to fill this book with cheesy phrases and lines, but unfortunately, there was inevitably going to be one. You choose who you want to be. It's in your control to establish your identity and what that looks like. In life, there are so many things we cannot be or do no matter what our efforts are. We can't walk on water and we can't fly. However, if you want to lose fat, you can. If you want to be the fittest you've ever been, you can. If you want to look the best you ever have, you can. So many people have a limiting belief that these things are out of reach or just not possible. I'm sorry, but it's not true. Will they require work, effort, time and consistency? Absolutely but you have the choice to do it. You have the choice to invest in yourself and you have the choice to form your identity. To once again reference James Clear in his book Atomic Habits, he mentions the pivotal role your identity plays in your actions and habits. He mentions that your current behaviours are simply a reflection of your current identity. What you do now is a mirror image of the type of person you believe that you are, either consciously or subconsciously. To change your behaviour for good, you need to start believing new things about yourself. You need to build identity-based habits. Here is an example that plays into this principle. When I was younger, about 15 years old, I grew up with two close friends. One of which was an avid rugby player. He was big, strong and made for a sport. My other friend, however, was not very sporty and found enjoyment from PlayStation games and Chinese food. To this day, I still remember his order. Six large chicken balls, chips and a curry sauce. Lastly, there was myself. I was very sporty and active. I played both football and rugby. Mind you, I will never claim that I was something special, but I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of being active. As the years passed, myself and my other sporty friend started to reap the physical benefits and rewards of sport. However, for our other friend, as expected, a lifestyle that was centred around inactivity 
and high calorie foods, weight gain began to occur. Fast forward a few more years of this and he decided to make a change. I remember when his parents bought him personal training sessions in the local gym to kickstart his quest to improve his health. I regret very few things in my life, but one thing I wish I did was provide more support through that monumental decision of him making positive change. I suppose I saw his lifestyle. I saw what he ate and what he enjoyed, and I just thought that he wouldn't be able to give that up to make change. Another year passes for him, yet this year was filled with gym sessions, good decisions, great nutritional practices, and incredible discipline. I remember the very moment he lifted up his top, upon my request I may add, to see an incredibly defined midsection. Let me assure you, having protruding abdominals at that age was no easy task. Myself and a magnitude of other people were truly astonished by his progress and results. To no surprise, he was questioned, what do you eat? How often do you train? Do you take supplements? What exercise are you doing in the gym? Of course the answers to these questions hold importance, yet his change came from something far greater than just wanting abs or wanting to lose fat. He no longer wanted to be seen or see himself as the unfit and overweight gamer in a group of friends that were fit and active. People saw his progress and tried to mimic his actions, yet these were short-lived as they simply didn't value the actions as much as he did. The day-to-day -day actions of him prepping meals, going to the gym, sacrificing high-calorie foods, and staying on track was so much more than just achieving a goal. It came down to him shaping who he was as a person. These very actions and habits were in place to form an identity he wanted and buried his former identity of the friend who eats lots of Chinese food and plays PlayStation. He wanted to see himself as more and it's safe to say he most certainly did that. We could dissect every action, every decision and every choice he made to succeed in looking better. But what really fueled everything, what really created positive, long-lasting change was his desire to create a new identity, an identity that he wanted. To this day, he is still in great shape. He is still active and he still adheres to all the habits he implemented all those years ago. The change he made and the identity he created still inspires me today. Should you ask any person who is fit, healthy and eats well, how do you do it? They will rarely reply with, it's so hard or it's the most challenging thing ever. And the reason is because their actions, behaviours, habits and mindset are so automatic. They don't find it hard because it comes down to who they are as a person and the very identity they have created from these repetitive actions. So if you want to succeed in your health and fitness goals, you have to ask yourself, is your current identity going to allow you to do that? Are you known for being the big drinker or the guy who loves pizza all the time? If so, you have to ask yourself if your current identity will allow you to succeed in your newly developed goals and aspirations to get healthier. Your identity shapes the actions you do and the decisions you make. Keep this in the forefront of your mind before you set out monumental goals. Your identity and the actions you wish to implement have to be congruent. Chapter 20. Pushing and Pulling. The Key to Dietary Success. Nowadays, there is an endless number of ways to eat well and achieve results. There is no such thing as the perfect diet, nor is there a one-size-fits-all method. Dietary success is going to be highly dependent on you and what works best for your life. With that being said, I'm going to share my most valuable nutrition advice that I hope will lead you to dietary success. As I mentioned, I do not want this audiobook to take a left turn into macros, calories, fasting, ketogenic diets, and so on. By me doing this, it takes me further off track on what I really need you to understand. The principle of pushing and pulling with your nutrition. In regards to nutritional practices, we ultimately want to improve our nutrition and get results while not significantly decreasing our quality of life. To enjoy the fun things in life, like dinners out with friends and boozy brunches, yet still be able to get results. We need to understand when to push good nutrition and when we can pull back 
and give ourselves more leeway. If we try to always push good nutrition and be perfect, we will inevitably fail because this isn't sustainable or enjoyable for that matter. Furthermore, if we allow ourselves too much leeway, too much moderation and frequently indulge, the negative effects will accumulate, i.e. fat gain. It's about the sweet spot, understanding and applying the correct actions and mindset at the correct time. Taking Christmas time, for example, there is absolutely no chance I would tell anyone to diet, restrict or tighten up their nutrition over the Christmas period. This is simply not the time. It is not the time to try and push good nutrition. It's a time to sit back, relax with family, drink wine by the fire and enjoy chocolate for breakfast. Trying to push good nutrition during this festive period will either result in a boring, unmemorable Christmas or produce feelings of failure as you give in to the Christmas calorie temptations. It's a lose-lose situation. The best nutrition advice I can give you is not about calories, macronutrients, when to eat or what to eat. It is simply understanding the best time to comply with good nutritional practices, when to push and when to pull. This will enable you to enjoy events like birthdays, weddings and weekends away, yet still provide you with the results you are seeking. If you are worrying, stressing and trying to diet during special occasions and events, I personally think you've missed the target and objective of healthy nutritional practices. There is so much time and so many opportunities to push good nutrition, but it's about setting yourself standards and being disciplined to do this. Let's look at the principle of pushing and pulling as a percentage of your week. If we calculate a Saturday night as a percentage, it works out at around 5%. If you go out every Saturday night, this will consist of only 5% of your entire week. Birthdays, weddings, Christmas parties, weekend drinks with your friends or any other celebratory event. These will take up about 5% of your week. Occasionally, 10-15% to 15% if it lasts for two days. Taking the upper limit of 10%, this leaves you with 90%. 90% of your week to make good choices, to stay on plan, to push good nutrition to control your calorie intake, to do your workouts, to hit your steps and to manage your alcohol intake. There is so much opportunity to make good choices and progress. Don't forget about them and don't neglect them. If you are struggling to eat well, progress and see results, please do not think it is because of the few drinks on a Saturday night or the Friday night chocolate bar or the Sunday morning fry. This is where people worry stress and think one weekend, one birthday or one wedding is going to significantly hinder their results. No one, and I mean no one, will be or is overweight from eating one bad or high calorie meal from time to time. Weight gain is caused from a number of interdependent factors that coexist over time. Not one meal that pushes you over your calories on a given day. The Sunday fry or the Saturday night drinks only become so-called bad when you do not have the conducive actions behind you as and when you include them. Staying at a healthy body fat and progressing is not about being perfect 100% of the time. It's about staying consistent with good actions for 90% of the time to enable you to enjoy the other 10%. You have to understand when to push and when to pull. People have a bad weekend or even a bad week. They start to panic, worry and sometimes throw in the towel. This is literally the exact opposite of what you should do. If you've had an indulgent weekend, whether it was planned or unplanned, just put it behind you and designate your effort, energy and focus on what you're going to do from that point forward. It's alarming to see how often people have an unfavourable weekend to then put no provisions in place to get back on track. They think it's the bad weekends that has led them to a position of unfavourable health. It's not. It's actually all their behaviours, actions and habits prior to and post the bad weekend. Of course the bad weekend doesn't help, but it's not the dictating factor for so many. After a Saturday night, we have 90% of the week ahead to make conducive and positive choices. The choice is yours to do so. 
push when you're able and pull when you need. This will inevitably allow you to enjoy birthdays, weddings and social occasions with little restriction while still getting results. However, if you were to indulge on the weekend, but the week before and after you don't get your exercise in, meals aren't prepared, you don't hit your steps, you mindlessly snack, order a takeaway from being unprepared and include alcohol, you start to see where the issues arise. There's too much pulling and in most cases, not a significant amount of pushing. The time off from pushing good nutrition should be thoroughly enjoyed as you've earned the right to pull back and enjoy it. I honestly can't remember the last time I went to a special occasion or an outing and didn't drink alcohol or had to give the pizza a miss. The reason for this is I simply do not need to. If I nail the other 90% of my week, I can afford that 5-10%. to However, if I slack with good nutrition, miss workouts and include too much moderation, this 90% of potentially conducive actions becomes less and less. Here's my thought process of when I have an occasion coming up and I know I'm going to indulge more. I tell myself this, in two weeks time, I'm going to be at that event, drinking endless amounts of beer, eating pizza, not counting my calories and being hung over the next day. I know how much I will be indulging. I know I'm not going to be moderate in my consumption and I know I'm not going to restrict myself. Keeping this in mind, there is no reason why I shouldn't be able to eat well, exercise and comply with good actions for the next two weeks. It's a trade-off that I'm most certainly okay with. Two weeks pass, I feel successful, accomplished and I've stayed on track. This ultimately enables me to enjoy the event for everything it will offer with no feelings of guilt. I then return back to my usual good actions on the Monday. I consistently push good nutrition because this will allow me to pull back at the times when I want to, when I need to, and when it really matters. I'm not going to be the person to say no to cake at a birthday party. Referring back to the earlier chapter of sacrifice, you can't eat and drink whatever you want during the week and also binge on big events. There's no push there. There's just a constant and steady pull. There has to be a degree of sacrifice. There has to be that push. If you are in a position where you're going to weddings, birthdays and special occasions and you're having to massively limit and restrict yourself from some wine and cake, my guess is that you're simply not pushing enough for 90% of the time. Your weekly actions simply don't give merit for the weekend consumption. I would suggest you look at this and think, do you really want to be trying to push good nutrition during the hardest times, like weddings and birthdays? My guess is no. So I recommend you start looking at ways to implement more conducive strategies to push good nutrition in circumstances that are easier for you. For example, when there are weekends when there is nothing on, no one's out or nothing exciting is happening, why don't you take it upon yourself to do an AFW, an alcohol-free weekend? There is a magnitude of benefits in doing this. You stay on track for two weeks, you feel more energetic from a fresh weekend, you build momentum, you build good habits, and it means you can enjoy the drinks next weekend even more. To conclude, I want you to think back to our input and output calendar. If you know there's going to be three red boxes in both Saturday and Sunday at a two-day wedding you have coming up, you have to think about your input both before and after that weekend. If you want results, you need to be capitalizing on the 90%. You have to be pushing good nutrition, good training and good decisions consistently. This will ultimately allow you to enjoy weekends, enjoy the special occasions, enjoy life and still get results. At the end of the day, that's the goal, isn't it? Chapter 21. Decisive moments and consequential thinking. In this chapter... I'm going to discuss two pivotal factors in the decision-making process, owning the decisive moments and the use of consequential thinking. This chapter will provide you with two useful mindset tools to utilize when the inevitable tough times prevail in your health and fitness journey. When examining the compliance and undertaking of conducive actions, I like to use the principle of decisive moments 
and the role they play in the decision-making process. In addition, when examining non-conducive actions and how to correct them, I like to use the principle of consequential thinking. Taking meal preparation as an example for a positive action. It's Sunday night, you're staying in, and you've just hit the Sunday evening slump after you've consumed a rather hefty hungover lunch. You know you have no prepped lunches or dinners for the week ahead. However, in your current state, getting up, going into the kitchen, and cooking just seems like a monumental task. You have a decision to make. Get up and prep your food for the week, or don't. This is where you have to own the decisive moment. The more you sit, the more you contemplate, the more likely you will talk yourself out of it. I'll just do it tomorrow. There's plenty of time during the week to cook. Or, I'll just buy a healthy lunch out for this week. We give ourselves false promises to justify our current indecisiveness. When it comes to favourable actions and tasks that are in line with our goals, don't think, just act. A quote by Dan Millman, an American author, reiterates this point very well. While some of us act without thinking, too many of us think without acting. People will often sit and think, but in most instances, it will ultimately result in no action. The brain will favour short-term satisfaction over long-term reward should you not act in that decisive moment. Taking meal preparation for example again. I get home from work at around 9pm most evenings, sometimes 9.30. I work long hours and when I get home, I'm not exactly thrilled about the idea of prepping my overnight oats for the next few days. But I know it needs to be done. When I get home, I avoid putting on my sweats and sitting in front of the TV. Because if I do this, I simply won't prepare my overnight oats. I know this because it's happened before, and if I don't put the appropriate provisions in, it will happen again. Instead, I walk into the house, put my bag in the hallway, and head straight into the kitchen and begin preparing my oats. After work, I am met with a decisive moment. The decision I make in that moment can and will dictate how I look, feel, and perform in the future. Now you may be thinking, Phil, you're putting a bit too much emphasis on one portion of oats. But let me assure you, I'm not. You are met with decisive moments every single day, and these add up. Remember, small wins are everything when it comes to results. You may not think one portion of overnight oats or one workout is all that significant. And you're right, a single meal or a single workout isn't going to be the defining factor in getting results or not. However, taking control of the decisive moments every day, of every week, of every month, most certainly will be a defining factor for success or failure. A decisive moment can also have a knockoff effect on your mindset, choices, and actions to follow. For instance, have you ever experienced a moment where you're craving chocolate or crisps, and the next thing you know, you're 800 calories deep with crisp crumbs everywhere and questioning how it even happened? It's safe to say nearly all of us have experienced this at some point. What's worse, we can often allow this moment to determine our future behaviours. Let's be honest, we're not exactly in the mood to go for a walk or do some exercise after eating a family-sized chocolate bar. However, on the other hand, if I were to wake up and make the decision of doing a Sunday morning workout, I would most definitely be more inclined to eat a better breakfast and feel more accomplished on my Sunday. If you struggle to make conducive choices and actions, I urge you to ask yourself, are you failing because you are thinking too much and not acting? Is your contemplation leading you to an excuse or a reason as to why you don't do something? If you know you need to do a food shop, don't think about the drive there. Don't think about the idea of waiting at the checkout. Don't think about carrying the bags to the car. And don't think about the barriers and unpleasantries of doing the food shop. You know what needs to be done. So don't think and just act. The moment you have your shoes on and close the front door behind you, you've done the hardest part. You've owned the decisive moment. In addition, you're not going to drive halfway to the shops to then turn around and say you're not bothered anymore. Just like you're not going to go to the gym, do a warm-up set, to then decide to go back home. Deciding to go, putting on your gym gear, and getting to the gym is 90% of the battle. There are a multitude of decisive moments throughout your day, and in most cases, they are small moments yet highly significant in the grand scheme of results. It's putting on your runners to aid in the decision of going for a walk. 
It's putting on your gym gear as soon as you get home. So you mentally prepare yourself that you're going to the gym. And it's taking the pan out and putting it on the heat to begin cooking your weekly lunches. These small moments may seem insignificant and many don't give them the attention they require. However, a positive action or habit always starts with a decisive moment. Don't neglect or undervalue them. They are the beginning of every success. Consequential thinking. In the previous section, owning the decisive moment is a great tool to take positive action, like cooking your meals, going to the gym, or going for a walk. However, with consequential thinking, I use this as a tool to avoid non-conducive or unfavorable actions. There are two areas of the brain, the limbic system, which is associated with our emotions, and the cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe, which is associated with logical thinking and reasoning. Unfortunately, our emotional brain will often take over at the first sight of instant gratification. Eating the chocolate that's in the office, smoking a cigarette, or drinking beers on a Saturday night. All of these actions will supply someone with instant reward and pleasure. This is why it's often very hard to resist highly palatable and calorie-dense foods, even though we know it's not necessarily good for us. The logical brain is fully aware about the impact and effect these things will have on our health. Despite this, our actions will often lean towards instant pleasure instead of long-term gain. With this in mind, we aren't exactly in the most favorable position when it comes to eating well and exercising more, because there are many other things that will be more enjoyable, less stressful, and easier for us to undertake. This is why I believe putting every provision in place to favor logical thinking will have its benefit in one way or another. Consequential thinking involves evaluating the costs and benefits of our choices and is vital for managing our impulses and acting intentionally rather than reacting. Consequential thinking can be a great tool to bypass this instant gratification and keep you on track. I have found it to be a very valuable tool when non-favorable decisions present themselves. Taking cravings, for example, a component of nutrition that can take many off track when trying to lose fat and eat better. Cravings are normal and we all experience them from time to time. Although, from experience, I see people succumb to cravings with little thought or logical thinking when experiencing them. It's often within minutes from experiencing an initial craving of wanting a biscuit to finishing the entire pack to then curse your weak willpower. Let me assure you, you don't need a YouTube video to boost your motivation or strengthen your willpower. You probably just need to think a little more. You need to designate a little more time to think about the consequences of the choices, actions and decisions you make. When people give in to a craving, they often immediately regret it. They question why they did it and feel worse off in more ways than one, physically, emotionally and mentally. Ironically, you can also nearly bet that it will happen again. That same choice will be made at some stage down the line, unless you start implementing some consequential thinking. I'll use myself as an example and when I use consequential thinking. I love ice cream, but ice cream does not love me. Without going into too much information, let's just say my insides don't respond very well to it. Regardless of this, my eyes still light up when someone mentions that there is apple pie and vanilla ice cream for dessert. There has been many times in the past that I've been shoveling ice cream into the bowl before even considering the after effects. As the creamy ice cream melts into the warm indulgent apple pie, my mouth waters and all other thoughts of calories, macronutrients and more specifically, my insides go out the window. Yeah, you could definitely say my emotional brain trumps my logical brain in that moment. From doing this a number of times, the consequences of ice cream consumption just got a bit much for me. The repercussions of eating ice cream compounded together to really make me question the worth of consuming it. After a few more dessert offers, I began giving the ice cream a miss. I know what ice cream tastes like. That's the immediate gratification. But I also know how it makes me feel. That's the delayed negative. The more attention I gave to the consequences of the immediate pleasure, the less attractive it seemed. I thought to myself, sure it's tasty, but it's going to upset my stomach, negatively impact my sleep, and make my bedroom require lots of Febreze air freshener. I became more attentive to the negatives. This made me more thoughtful when it came to the choices that offered that short-term dopamine hit. I started consequentially thinking a lot more, 
not just with ice cream, but with everything. When a choice presented itself, I gave myself the time to sit back and designate more thought to the consequences of that very choice. Doing this not only allows me to assess things with more clarity and rational thinking, but in doing so, the time it takes to do this can result in that short-term want or desire expiring. Walter Miskol conducted research at Stanford University in the 1960s involving marshmallows and four-year-old children. The children were told they could either eat the single marshmallow in front of them immediately or wait for 10 minutes without a researcher present, after which time they could have two marshmallows. According to Miskel, the children who waited for two marshmallows demonstrated a significant indicator of consequential thinking. There were marked differences between the groups as they moved into adulthood. The group who opted to wait for two marshmallows were found to be more socially competent, more resilient to stress, and able to engage their self-resilience to pursue their goals. As adults, the group of children who took the single marshmallow tended to be more negatively affected by stress, more reluctant to engage in social contact, and more likely to react angrily to frustrations. To conclude, when you want the pizza that will push you over your weekly calories, think about how you will feel after it, not when you're having it. When you're about to cancel your early morning exercise class, think about how you'll feel after doing it not the feeling of staying in bed. If you're doing dry January, but are tempted to drink, think about how you'll feel after the drinks, not during the drinks. Think about the consequences. Think about how you'll feel and how you will look when you make your decisions. Are you prioritizing short-term satisfaction over long-term gain? Consequential thinking is not an easy thing to do. Just like nutrition and exercise, it requires practice. However, the more you practice it, the more autonomous it will become. You will start making conducive decisions and actions with such little effort that you won't even notice. Now that's a mindset that will enable you to succeed in your health and fitness goals. Chapter 22. Conscious Effort and Setting Standards Personally speaking, I believe people struggle with their health and fitness due to their lack of awareness and understanding of the necessary effort it requires. If you work one hour a week, do you expect to see a weekly paycheck that reflects a 40 hour week? If you were studying for an end of year exam, would you expect to get a result of 100% from doing an hour of study a day? And if you wanted to be fluent in another language, would you expect to be fluent from learning one word every week? The answer to all of these is no. If you want to be paid for 40 hours, you need to work the necessary hours. If you want a good grade in an exam, you have to study for multiple hours every day to become educated about the subject of interest. And if you want to be fluent in another language, you often have to live in the country that speaks that language. All of these achievements will require you to plan, prepare, and put a significant amount of effort in every day. So how does this relate to health and fitness? People will go to the gym once, twice, maybe even three times a week, yet their effort simply stops there. I'm sorry to say, if you are not making a daily conscious effort with your nutritional intake, if you are not making a daily conscious effort with your activity and exercise, and if you are not making a daily conscious effort with the habits and choices that favor your health, you will struggle to see tangible results. I've seen so many people spend weeks, months, and even years in the gym trying to lose fat with no success. Three hours in the gym every week is less than 2% of your week. No matter how hard you work in the gym or how consistent you are with going to the gym, if you are not making a daily conscious effort with all aspects of your health, you're going to struggle. The food you eat, your daily activity, the water you drink, your schedule exercise, and your daily habits. These components need to be given a certain amount of effort every day. I'm not saying your life has to be solely focused on health and fitness, but if you want to be healthier or get healthier, it most certainly has to be a focus. Planning, preparation and implementation is essential in order to ensure there is a certain level of effort being met. Without these components, effort will often be sporadic and insignificant. The following study is a great representation of how intention and effort 
plays a pivotal role in adhering to conducive actions. In 2001, researchers in Great Britain worked with 248 people to create better exercise habits over the course of two weeks. The subjects were split into three different groups. The first group was the control group. They were simply asked to track how often they exercised. The second group was the motivation group. They were asked not only to track their workouts, but also to read some material on the benefits of exercise. The researchers also explained to the group the role exercise plays in reducing the risk of coronary heart disease and improving heart health. Lastly, there was the third group. These subjects received the same presentation as the second group. This meant that the levels of motivation were matched, but they were also asked to make a plan for when and where they would exercise over the following week. Each participant in the third group completed the following sentence. Next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on a specific day, at a specific time, and in a specific place. After receiving all the necessary information, the three groups left. The results were as follows. In the first and second groups, 35-38% to 38% of people exercised at least once per week. This showed that the motivational presentation given to the second group seemed to have no meaningful impact on their actions. However, 91% of the third group exercised at least once per week. By writing down a plan that said exactly when and where they intended to exercise, the participants in the third group were much more likely to actually implement their planned actions. What this study shows is that in order to successfully adhere to a positive action, you need to make a significant and conscious effort. How it's going to be done, where it's going to be done, and when it's going to be done. This is the kind of effort that is needed for all the tasks that you wish to undertake. If you want to eat better in order to lose fat, just saying, I'm going to eat better, is simply not good enough. It is not specific enough and there is no call to action. There is no specific time or plan. It's merely just a thought. This study also reiterates why motivation is not a dependable factor for implementing conducive actions. Task. I want you to think about something you really want. This could be a leaner body, a nice car, a fancy house, a whole year of free travel or a position in your dream job. It's important to select something that you see a lot of value in. Now, in exchange for the valued item you've selected, you have to clean a bathroom. However, if the bathroom doesn't reach a certain standard of cleanliness, you won't get your valued item. In this instance, nearly every single person would scrub and clean that bathroom with tactical precision. You'd be using a toothbrush to clean the grout, a toothpick to remove soap scum, a tweezers to remove hair from the drain and your hands starting to cramp from scrubbing the toilet so hard. You would inspect every inch, every crack and every tile of the bathroom to ensure it reaches a standard of clean that you are happy with. Why? Because you know what's at stake. You know the reward. And if you don't put the necessary work and effort in, you won't get that reward. As you leave the bathroom and wait for inspection, you know you couldn't have done any more you put as much effort into cleaning that bathroom as you possibly could have. Your level of effort and the standard you left the bathroom in was enough to reward you with your valued item. So you may be thinking, Phil, what does this have to do with getting fitter, losing fat or improving habits? Well, honestly, it has everything to do with it. I want you to think about your fitness, your health and the way you look as the reward. If you are not happy with your current results, that's okay. Because as stated before, we are on a never-ending journey of improvement. Although ask yourself this, are you really putting in your best effort? Are you setting standards for yourself that are as high as the bathroom that you just imaginarily cleaned? If you were to treat the concept of your health and fitness as if it was based on only one day, you would do something similar to the bathroom. You would give it your all. You would exercise hard, walk plenty, eat incredibly well, avoid unnecessary high calorie foods and go to bed early. Both fortunately and unfortunately, our health and body doesn't work like this. It's not significantly affected from one day of good eating and exercise, just like it's not significantly affected from one day of inactivity and high calories. It responds to the accumulation of the standards you set. Is that standard adequate or inadequate? 
Treat your health like the prized possession it is. Designate the same standards to it as the bathroom you have imaginarily cleaned. If one day you don't give the bathroom quite the same scrub, or you even miss a day, the bathroom won't look much different. But it's essential that you set a high standard 80% of the time. Treat your health like you have only one day to get it right, and you will never struggle to achieve results. However, should you neglect it and think one workout a week or one good meal a day is sufficient enough, it's like spraying an air freshener in a bathroom that hasn't been cleaned for months. It's better than nothing, but that level of effort simply isn't enough should you wish to see significant change. At the end of every day, sit down and ask yourself, Have I truly given my best effort? Am I happy with the standard that I have adhered to? If the answer to this is no, make sure you think twice before you complain about the output, or worse, pack it in. Every day is a new day to give more effort, to increase your standards, and to get closer to that end result. You may not be there just yet, but don't let that affect today's effort. Evaluate your day based on your efforts, not on the end result of that day. For instance, if the scales haven't gone down that evening, it doesn't matter. What does matter is what you've done that day and the effort you've made to stay in line with your goals. Personally speaking, success doesn't come from the end result or where you place in a competition. It comes from the effort and the work you have done to get there. This is seen so often in sports like boxing and bodybuilding. You watch these athletes give everything they have, every day for months, and even years on end. Their effort is never-ending, and their commitment is a non-negotiable. You would expect, given their investment, should they lose, it would be soul-destroying, and be the beginning of the end for them and their careers. This couldn't be further from what actually happens. They hold their heads high, clap for their opponents, and are grateful for being in the position to partake. They rarely reject the outcome or bash the winner because deep down, they did everything they could. If you set a standard and a level of effort to adhere to, regardless of the outcome, pride and success will prevail, even if you don't get the goal this time around. I want you to think about this with your pursuit of a healthier and happier life. If you are doing everything you can, you must be proud of the result and keep going. However, If you aren't happy with the results, ask yourself, are you capable of more? And have you really cleaned the bathroom as best as you possibly could have? I want to share my dislike of three particular words and how they can be dangerous when setting yourself standards. Kinda, ish, and sorta. I will do my very best not to use these words and I encourage others to avoid them as well. As I just mentioned, It is important to set ourselves a certain standard of work, effort, and care with what we do. This standard slips very quickly when these words are introduced into our daily vocabulary. For example, I sort of ate well, I kind of stuck to the plan, and I was good-ish on the weekend. Sound familiar? You may see how this can become problematic rather quickly. Should we use these words, the non-negotiables in our daily life start losing structure and value. For instance, should I ask a client how their week has been and they reply with, I was good-ish or I was kinda good. This could honestly mean anything. In some cases, I prefer them to say it wasn't a good week for them because at least they are distinctly identifying how their week went. However, should they frequently use words like kinda, ish and sorta it becomes very difficult to understand what they are actually complying with. The lines become blurred and it's hard to identify the standards and degree of effort that are being met. In most cases, part-time compliance will not generate significant, sustainable results. To give some examples to put this into context, sort of hitting protein targets could mean consuming only half your required amount. Being kind of good on the weekend can often mean you've been good for half the Saturday, but less than ideal for the remainder of the weekend. And your workouts being good-ish may mean only one out of three workouts were actually beneficial. If we regularly incorporate these words into our health and fitness, it creates a large degree of uncertainty 
and in most cases, disappointment. People will get very disheartened when they don't see the result they want after the effort they've put in. However, you have to assess, evaluate, and ask yourself, did your efforts consistently reach the necessary standard to succeed? Did you kind of do what was necessary? Were you good-ish with your nutrition? In most cases, not all, but most, a substandard effort will not generate the level of results many are looking for. Chapter 23, Environment. If you recall in previous chapters, I mentioned that I don't highly depend on the principle of motivation to live a healthier life. Motivation comes and goes, so in my opinion, it's not a winning concept to base your success on. In addition, someone's level of discipline is going to be dependent on a magnitude of factors, such as current habits, their values, lifestyle considerations, their support network, and the focus of this chapter, their environment. I believe that if you can improve small aspects of your life, bit by bit, you will become far more accomplished in the long run. Just like a house being built, it starts with the foundation, and then it's built bigger and better, one brick at a time. This is no different when it comes to creating a better version of yourself. Don't start by thinking about the finished product. This is where so many people fail before they even begin. They don't start small enough. They forget about the small components, like the bricks of a house. In this chapter, I cover a very important building block in your health and fitness, your environment. Many will undervalue it and neglect it, but from my experience, your environment will play an integral role in your ability to succeed. I like to use myself as a bad example. This is for two reasons. Firstly, I never want to portray that I'm perfect and that I'm being judgmental of people's mistakes or poor choices. Secondly, this is the very reason why I feel so confident in the advice, guidance and information I give, because I have made the mistakes and faced the problems that people face on a daily basis. With this in mind, I'd like to use myself as a bad example and how an environment massively shaped and dictated my health and fitness practices at one point. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I shifted my business to home personal training instead of training clients in a gym. It was a very successful and smart move, but it most definitely had its downfall at the detriment of my physical health. I drove from house to house and trained all my clients in their back garden or houses. With the nature of my new work schedule, it consisted of a lot of driving, aka sitting down, a large degree of snacking and on-the-go foods, and my own training was often cancelled last minute due to the heavy traffic and getting to my next client. My steps were low, my digestion was pretty poor, training was being deprioritized, and my head just didn't feel screwed on because of all this. I knew it was only short term and necessary for my clients, so I was very happy to do it for the time being. Fast forward three months, as I now sit in my own personal training studio in which I run my business out of and train all my clients in. I have gym equipment at my fingertips, a fridge to store my meals, a microwave to heat up my food, a Nutribullet to make my smoothies, and my steps have been tripled from being on my feet coaching. My daily activity, my training, productivity, nutrition quality, passion for work, and energy have all increased immensely since getting the studio. All of these improvements didn't come because I made myself get more motivated, or because I told myself I needed to be more disciplined, but because of my environment. Where I was and where I spent my day shaped the decisions I made and the actions I took from a day-to-day -day basis. From coaching in the studio, instead of coaching on the road, so to speak, I don't mindlessly snack as my meal timing and eating structure is more scheduled. My training has improved immensely as I'm not skipping workouts due to traffic. My water intake has been standardized to three liters as I don't have to worry about having to go to the toilet. I do 15,000 steps every day from being on my feet coaching instead of intermittently being in the car. The studio has allowed me to plan, organize, and structure my day to a very high standard. This has resulted in my productivity, energy, and mood to be in a far more favorable position. So you see, if you asked me, Phil, how do I start eating better and exercising more? I would certainly not start by telling you to get more motivated or to make sure you're more disciplined or tell you you just have to want it more. Instead, I would advise you to look at your environment and identify if it is conducive 
or non-conducive to the actions in which you wish to implement. If you want to decrease the amount of chocolate you eat, yet you always have it in sight and in abundance in your house, it's going to be difficult for you to stop. If you want to limit mindless snacking, yet you always have crisps on the counter as you cook dinner, it's going to be difficult for you to stop. If you want to increase your daily protein intake, yet have no high protein foods prepared or at your disposable, it's going to be difficult for you to implement. Regardless of how motivated you are, regardless of how disciplined you are, your environment will play a pivotal role in your daily actions and decisions. It's up to you to ensure that you're in a position and an environment that will favour good actions. This doesn't just happen. You have to make a conscious effort in building an environment that will allow you to improve and progress. Your environment is not only where you situate yourself, but also the people you surround yourself with. You are a product of your environment. The people that you revolve your life around will play an influential role in your decisions, in your choices, and ultimately, your ability to improve. This is one of the most impeding factors that I see when people begin their quest to eat better, exercise more, and get healthier. This process involves more than just the person undertaking the quest of self-improvement. Their partner, their friends, and their family can be a catalyst to improvement, or they can be the ball and chain that creates friction and makes the journey a struggle every step of the way. When it comes to friends, if they do not support you, if they are additional and unnecessary weight that you have to bear and deal with, I strongly urge you to consider their presence in your life. If they are your true friends, they should understand the sacrifices, time and effort that is required when it comes to living a healthier life. That may mean not drinking on a few nights out. That may mean not going to every social gathering where food and drinks are a focal point. And it may mean saying no to lunch out as you have your prepared lunch to keep you on track. It's very easy for people to say something is stupid, silly or pointless should they not see the value in it. For example, if someone highly values their weekend drinks and food but their friend highly values losing weight and getting fitter, it's to no surprise they will judge and question their decisions. Don't feel obliged to stay friends with someone if they are not supporting your growth. Focus on you and the people that facilitate your desire to get better. This may mean cutting friends out of your circle, but this is not a reflection of you, but more them and their traits as a friend. With family, it's not quite as easy as deleting their name from your contacts and moving on. This next section is directed at the partners, husbands, wives or housemates. A partner's role will not only facilitate your efforts, but they will also be the positive reinforcement that you will need at some point. One of the most common barriers to someone adhering to good nutrition is often their partner's accompanying role. Ah, come on, let's just get a takeaway. You've been good all week. Or, we're both tired and don't want to cook anything. Using these common examples, it's to no surprise that the person trying to get healthier will succumb to these suggestions. However, if the partner was to really push the favourable option, for instance, I'll go to the shops now and get something for us. Or, we won't get takeaway tonight because you'll be eating out next weekend. It's this positive reinforcement that will have an enormous impact in the long run for their partner trying to improve. Unfortunately, I've seen some unideal circumstances with people and their attitude towards their partner's pursuit of positive change. For instance, an open bottle of wine becomes a shared bottle of wine, one pizza becomes two, and an evening walk becomes four hours of binge watching Netflix. Every night these choices will prevail and the people you surround yourself can and will dictate the outcome. So I ask, if your mum, sister, dad, brother, girlfriend, boyfriend, wife or husband is seeking to make change, create a healthier lifestyle and improve their body, understand that you play a big role. You can be the driving force behind them or you can be the anchor that holds them back. To conclude... Your environment and the people in that environment is a factor that you need to control to the best of your ability. Before you depend on willpower, before you seek for motivation and before you turn to self-discipline, focus on making your environment as fail-proof as possible. If your environment brings stress and emotional hardship, 
this needs to be addressed and improved. Reduce the friction in doing things you need to be doing and increase the friction on things you shouldn't be doing. Make your environment a place where you feel autonomous with conducive actions. Your environment may not always be perfect, but if you can standardize a conducive environment 80% of the time, that will result in a lot of positives, a lot of wins, and a lot of ticked green boxes. Chapter 24. Take control or lose control. In this opening paragraph, I want to, for the first time, quote myself. We have full control over our health. However, should we neglect it, it will have full control over us. At 25 years old, I feel I possess a good understanding of the things we should value in life and the things that will provide us with the happiness, joy and fulfillment we all seek. This will of course differ from person to person, but generally speaking, improving our health, feeling more confident in our body and becoming a better version of ourselves is a process that many value. Unfortunately, in some cases, this is a process that many don't get to experience. So many coaches will say, it's never too late to make positive change. Sure, everyone has the opportunity and capability to make positive change. But for some, their mindset has been hardwired for so long, which makes the process of change far more complicated. I've experienced this firsthand with a client. I will not disclose the name, gender, location, or time in which I coached them. However, my time spent working with them probably created the fire in my belly to write this book. Therefore, I think it's necessary to include it. I write this chapter for the younger version of the aforementioned client. This could very well be the position you are in today. So listen closely. This client came to me looking to lose weight, improve their health, and decrease day-to-day -day muscle aches and pains. They had a good bit of weight to lose, and their day-to-day -day pain and discomfort was quite severe. To put it simply, this was due to a weak, neglected, and inactive body. They had lost control. This client was 40 years old and had lived a pretty sedentary and unhealthy lifestyle. 25 years of poor nutrition, no exercise, and numerous unsuccessful dieting attempts. Like any new client that comes to me, I sat down with this client and went through everything to get them in the best starting position. Evaluating their goals, why they wanted to make change, assessing what they have done before, the barriers they faced, educating them on nutrition, and finally, start to implement very small positive changes. Fast forward a number of weeks. This client followed nothing I asked them to do. If you know me as a coach, and even from listening to this book, I start small, I start basic, and I start with manageable tasks for people to implement. This client didn't track their calories. They binged on the weekends. They didn't do their steps. They didn't do their check-ins and they took no responsibility. I scaled these systems and tasks back to the utmost basics, the bare minimum, yet nothing changed. They came into every workout with a bad attitude and an even worse mindset. They looked at the clock every two minutes and were unhappy with every exercise I prescribed. They experienced muscular pain and niggles from doing the most basic, simplified, and regressed exercises. Just an FYI, I have accumulated over 8,000 hours of in-person coaching in my career, so I have a very high level of correct exercise programming and all the considerations that come with it. I am more than confident in saying that prescribed exercises were not the issue, more their attitude towards training as a whole. Even if the exercise was painless, they would still resist and roll their eyes at every chance they got. The best way to describe the situation was this client felt hard done by from having to exercise because they had to make change to their nutrition and their lifestyle. Every weigh-in, they were either the same weight or heavier than the previous weigh-in. I really didn't care about the weight, because as I said in this book, progress is so much more than just the scales. But what I really struggled to accept were the excuses, the lack of responsibility, and the lack of effort. As you can expect, this client wasn't happy with their results, and our relationship began to turn pretty hostile because of it. A few more weeks passed and every day I brainstormed how I could help, how I could provide more value and how I could get them to progress. I read, researched 
and asked numerous other coaches for help. Yet unfortunately, nothing seemed to work. It came to a point where nothing positive was happening from my end as a coach or their end as a client. It came to a fairly harsh and abrupt end working with this client. Following this, I received unpleasant and pretty spiteful messages following this. And this was the first and last time in my coaching career I ever experienced this. So you might be thinking, Phil, what's the point of this story? Don't worry, I'm coming to the take-home point very soon. The days that followed the unpleasant messages, I couldn't sleep or concentrate on anything. Every day, for nearly a week, the following thoughts flooded my brain. Should I give up coaching? Is this job really for me? And what could I have done to make that client progress? All of the above were on constant repeat in my head, minute after minute, day after day. After constant reflection, do you want to know what I wish I could have done? Two things. One, I wish I could have told their younger self to take control of their health sooner. To take control of their health before it took control of them. There's a quote that says, an ounce of preservation is worth a pound of cure. And in this instance, this individual was dealing with the harsh reality of having to try and cure 25 years of neglected health. Secondly, I wish I could have given them this book. I wish I'd clearly lay out what was necessary for this client to make change, what barriers they would face, and ultimately, value their health for what it's worth. I can't guarantee reading this book would result in them succeeding, but I do think it would have given them a better mindset and expectation of what's to come. Obviously, I, nor anyone, can go back in time and tell someone to make change sooner, but I do have the capability to learn from this experience and to tell you now. If you are not prioritizing your health, if you are not regularly exercising, if you are not giving any thought to your nutrition or mental well-being, I beg you to start, even if that's just making a plan for now. Not just for the present you, but for the future you. You may not care or value your health and body right now, but I promise, you will get to a position in your life where your health will need to be a priority. Not only for you, but the people that depend on you. I don't want to say you get to a certain age and change is impossible, because that's simply not true. I have had clients that have made incredible and sustainable positive change at all ages. However, from anecdotal experience, your ability to comply and undertake positive habits is far more difficult the longer you wait. The choices you make now will inevitably form who you are and what you do in the future. Should you seek to make positive change after 10, 20 or 30 years, it may go against everything you've done up until that point in your life. I once heard a quote and it has stayed with me for years. The chains of habits are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. I would like you to re-listen to that quote. You may think a sedentary lifestyle isn't a big problem right now. You may think slow yet gradual weight gain isn't a big problem right now. And you may think the one too many takeaways isn't a big problem right now. However, these compound over the years. And before you realize, these problems become so significant that they can become an unbreakable chain that holds you back. I experienced these unbreakable chains with the client in question. No matter what I did, no matter what I said, I couldn't undo the 25 years of habits and I couldn't change the fixed mindset that they possessed. That's what spurred me on to write this book. I don't want anyone to experience the feeling of hopelessness with their health. I never want you to feel like your health and bodies preventing you from doing what you want to do. However, should you neglect and mistreat your health and body, that is a reality that you may face. I want to help you create a mindset that allows you to progress, improve, and start making change. Take control today, or run the risk of losing control tomorrow. A conclusion to create change. We live in a fast-paced world. We all experience the pressure of timestamps, milestones and deadlines that we are in a rush to achieve or think we need to achieve. 
In addition, everyone wants results yesterday. Please, do not wish away the process of improving your health and body. Whoever you are, and whatever your goal is, we all desire the same thing. We want to feel good. This feeling comes from the process of losing 10 pounds, lifting 100 kilos, or enjoying food with no guilt. The goal is to feel better, but this feeling does not come from the end result, but the process itself. Believe me when I say, if you're not enjoying the process, your goals and desires will have such little value. I'm not going to lie to you, a healthier version of yourself will not come quickly and it probably won't come easy. It's a journey that will have many incredible successes and moments of joy. But it's essential you understand, there is no end. There is no end destination because the destination always changes. How you want to look and what you want to accomplish will change as you progress. Don't wish you were fitter and don't wish you weighed less because you are overlooking the very process that will make you feel how you want to feel. I'm telling you this now. You will always be happier when you're in a state of becoming, not in a state of being. I hope you can use this book as a roadmap and a guide to make your journey that bit smoother, but more importantly, a whole lot more enjoyable. In order to create the best version of yourself, you need to establish your why. Your quest to improve should never start because you feel like you should, but because you want to. It all starts with the desire to change who you are and how you see yourself. Sure, on the surface level, you may just want to lose weight, but what creates a trajectory for success is knowing who you want to be. Establish your identity Do you want to be the person who feels out of control and displeased with your health? Or do you want to be the person who is confident and experiencing all the positive attributes that a healthy life will bring? If you have not established your true desire for change, conducive actions will be implemented for a finite amount of time. I can assure you, there will be times that you don't want to exercise and don't want to eat well. But if your vision and reason for starting is significant enough, no matter what challenges arise, you will have the mindset that will enable you to succeed. I hope this book has provided the necessary content to reframe the way you think. Exercising more and eating better is no easy task. It takes dedication, effort and consistency. But instead of thinking, you have to, think, you get to. As cheesy as it sounds, your body offers you an incredible amount of opportunities. Opportunities that you will miss if you don't identify and value them. Instead of thinking you have to exercise, think that you get to exercise. Instead of thinking you have to eat well, think that you get to eat well. Your mindset will dictate if you see a task as an opportunity to benefit from or a hindrance to your life. The opportunity to improve and progress comes with every day, every trip to the shops, and every workout. Never forget the incredible opportunity you have to do so. Your have to could truly be someone else's dream to be able to. There's no doubt about it. In your quest to improve, you will make mistakes. You will run into difficulties and problems along the way. With this being said, you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. So own the mistakes you make and don't deny them. However, I hope you can now identify, learn and correct your mistakes more effectively, but don't be afraid to fail. Remember, problems will stay problems if there is no provisions. Identifying a problem is half of the solution. The other is action. If you miss a workout or you fail to hit your daily protein targets, What are the provisions to ensure this won't become a habit? What are the actionable tasks to prevent future reoccurrence? Failure allows us to identify where we went wrong, what we found challenging, and how to make the appropriate actions to move forward. Set standards for your success, but also set standards for your failures. It's easy to keep going when you're winning, but what are your standards 
should you, and when you experience failure? Will you sit idle and allow the problem to manifest and repeat? Or will you see failure as an opportunity to learn, grow, and improve? A winning mindset will enable you to choose the latter. Awareness is essential when looking to improve your health and fitness. If you are not aware of what you are doing, you cannot expect to improve and progress towards your goals. Whatever your goal is, if that's losing fat, putting on muscle, getting stronger, being happier, developing your business or any other life goal, you have to be aware of what you're doing now and what you need to be doing in order to improve. Your input has to be congruent with your desired output. How many green boxes are you accumulating from a day-to-day basis? How many actions are you consistently completing that are in line with your vision of getting better? Goals are important. They are necessary for the direction you want to go, but the processes and strategies you have in place are for moving in that direction. Process goals are the key to success. It doesn't matter how much you want something or how determined you are. Actions and processes bridge the gap between wanting and having. It's important to plan, prepare and think about your goals, but be under no illusion. Success will only come from action. Results require sacrifice. Without making change, there will be no change. A fundamental difference between one succeeding or failing in their health and fitness goals is their ability to accept and make sacrifices. However, with time and consistency, sacrifices will no longer appear as sacrifices, more as trade-offs. The results you get from these trade-offs become so attractive and so rewarding that they will become a non-negotiable within your life. You will simply do them on autopilot, like brushing your teeth. Improving your health is a full-time job. Part-time action and commitment will only get you so far. You wouldn't expect a weekly paycheck for 40 hours should you only work 20. So don't expect significant results should you be putting in an insignificant amount of effort. Set standards for yourself, yet set no limitations. With the appropriate effort and well-established set of standards, there is no reason you cannot be in the best shape of your life and there is no reason you can't feel better than ever. Should you fail to set standards, creeping normality will occur. Creeping normality is a process by which a major change can be accepted as normal if it happens slowly through small and often unnoticeable increments of change. You may not think 3,000 steps makes a difference on a daily basis. Ah, it's fine. I hit 7,000, so I'm close enough to my 10,000 daily steps. Here's the eye-opener. 3,000 steps every day for a year equates to over 10 pounds of fat from a calorie expenditure standpoint. Should you fail to set yourself standards, you are leaving a significant amount of potential progress on the table. Should you become annoyed, frustrated, or confused that you are not seeing the results you want, ask yourself, are you really giving it your best effort? Are you reaching a certain standard and are you using too many kindas and sortas with the things you need to be doing? Make sure your standards are both realistic and achievable. But remember, keep the bathroom analogy in mind. Are you cleaning the bathroom to a certain standard? And is that standard in line with your valued outcome? Or is creeping normality setting in? You have to set call to action tasks. Having a goal or telling yourself that you will do something is simply not sufficient enough. Saying, I'm going to eat healthy this week, is not enough. There is no call to action and there is no implementation strategy for this goal. In most cases, people don't rely on luck, willpower, motivation or chance to wake up in the morning. They set an alarm. That's the call to action. It's what enables you to get up and do what needs to be done throughout your day. This should be no different when it comes to your health. It's all well and good wanting to eat better, just like wanting to wake up earlier. But without a call to action, like an alarm, it's merely just a thought. People will wake up and begin their day with no plan, no provisions, 
and no call to action to eat well or implement exercise. Then they wonder why they find it so hard or keep falling off track. The actions you wish to implement in order to improve your health need to be realistic and manageable. Start small and accumulate small wins every day. Don't focus on the 20 kilos you want to lose. Focus on losing one kilo and repeating that 19 more times. In an effort to improve your physical health, you have to take responsibility. You have to take responsibility for your choices and your actions. A good coach will put every provision in place to enable you to progress and succeed. But at the end of the day, it is up to you. As the phrase goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You are the one that holds the fork that puts food into your mouth. And you are the one in control of putting one foot in front of the other to do your steps. Losing fat and eating better are challenging tasks. You will require help, guidance and support. But you can't be babied. Accept responsibility for your actions. Take ownership of your results. And don't blame the circumstances in which you're able to change. Always look at the big picture and choose your battles carefully. There are so many components and approaches that will make you feel and look better. However, it is essential that you are focusing on the components that will yield the greatest return. Don't step over 100 euro to pick up 10 cent. Don't designate your energy and effort on things that will have a small return in the grand scheme of your results. Stay in line with your nutritional requirements. Sleep lots, exercise plenty, drink your water, manage your stress, recover when you need, and most importantly, be consistent. Should you adhere to this, you'll be doing pretty damn well. Don't stress about brown rice versus white rice, or frozen vegetables versus fresh vegetables. These are the battles that are not worth the effort. Furthermore, you subtract from the potential effort in fighting the bigger and more important battles. Give yourself no leeway with excuses. They will create limitations and lower your standards. We are all well able to know when we give ourselves excuses. So be strict on yourself and refer back to your why. When you need to do a necessary task, utilize decisive thinking. Don't let your mind wander off. You know what needs to be done, so don't sit and think about it. Just take action. Every moment you wait and contemplate is another vote in favour of the unfavourable path. When moments and decisions arise in which you want to avoid, utilise consequential thinking. When cravings and sudden urges occur, don't immediately act and satisfy these short-term wants. Should you succumb to every craving, every short-term desire, and every chocolate bar, it will not only impact your results, but more so your mindset and your ability to say no in the future. These moments will require more self-control, but like anything, the more you practice, the better you will get. You will be able to think and act with more logic and reasoning. Get good at the boring stuff. Every aspect of improving your health won't be exciting and sexy. With anything in life, you have to be consistent. But more importantly, consistent with the things you don't want to do at times. The main goal of your nutrition and exercise is to produce the outcome you want, not to excite you. Entertainment value will only get you so far. Sure, it's important to enjoy what you're doing, as this will improve adherence. However, enjoyment will quickly diminish if you see no returns for your investment. You have to accept that the basics need to be done and done with consistency. Don't question and wonder why you're not seeing progress if you're ongoingly changing the input. If you kept changing, subtracting and adding different ingredients when making a cake, the end result would be different every time. Control the controllables, establish the non-negotiables and stick to the plan. Don't compare yourself now to a previous you. If one, five or ten years ago 
you were fitter and had less body fat. It doesn't matter. Focus on the present and the future. I see so many people comparing themselves to who they were 10 years ago. You may have been fitter, but now you have a family. You may have had less body fat, but now you have your dream job and financial freedom. Life is a constant variable. Things will change, so don't compare yourself now to where you were 10 years ago. Let go of the old you. It's an anchor that is holding you back. Focus your energy on today, plan for tomorrow, and forget about yesterday. There will always be someone fitter, stronger, and leaner than you. The moment you compare yourself to anyone else is the moment your own self-worth will begin to suffer. Focus on your own journey and value it for everything it's worth. Something that you may not believe, but in a world with millions of incredible physiques and bodies, I would not trade my body for anyone else's. Not because I think my body is better, not at all, but because of the time, effort and care I've invested into my body and health. We won't be distracted by comparison if we are captivated by purpose. Bob Goff Where you are and who you surround yourself with is everything when trying to improve your health, fitness and habits. Your environment can be the difference between an enjoyable and smooth process of progression or an unenjoyable experience that presents multiple barriers and no success. Make your environment work for you and not against you. If every day you wake up and feel like eating well and exercise is a colossal and unenjoyable task, something is wrong. Exercise and good nutrition should improve the quality of your life, not decrease it. Assess if your environment is creating the difficulty for you. Swimming against the current will always be a losing battle, no matter how hard you swim. Leave willpower, motivation and discipline aside for one moment and ask yourself, is your environment allowing you to progress or is it creating friction at every conducive decision you need to make? You have to be in the right mindset to make positive change, but you also need to be in the right environment as well. As I come to the end of this book, you may be thinking, where do I start from here? Or it seems like there's so much required in order to succeed and improve my health. So I need you to understand something. Success is a status that is built and established every day. So many people think they need to see the scales decrease or see muscle being added to deem them successful in their efforts. This is simply not the case. Every day you complete a workout, that's success. Every day you hit 10,000 steps, that's success. Every time you drink your daily water, that's success. And every time you have your meals prepared for the week ahead, that's success. All of these tasks may seem unimpressive, insignificant and unnoticed by so many. However, they compound together over time and generate the output that is the long-term goal. The goal of looking good and feeling good. So many people will forget about the small wins in their quest to success. Health and fitness success isn't like a big bang. You don't go from nothing to something to then deem yourself successful. It's hundreds of thousands, even millions of actions that progress you bit by bit on your health and fitness journey. Don't think about what you need to do for 30 days. Think about what you need to do for one day and then repeat that 29 more times. You will begin to understand and value how every good decision on a daily basis creates success. Personally speaking, health and fitness success is not about a number, a certain weight, a certain look or a certain body fat. It's simply being that bit better than you were yesterday. Herbert Spencer, an English philosopher, once said, The great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. As I conclude this audiobook, I hope I have provided you with an abundance of helpful information 
But in order to gain true value from it, you need to put it to action. In the introduction, I compared exercise and nutrition information as the money on your debit card and this audiobook as the debit card itself. I want you to use your newly developed mindset to start investing in your health and fitness. I wish you the best of luck and enjoy the returns of your investment. This was Creating a Winning Mindset to Succeed in Your Health and Fitness Written and read by Phil Donnelly All references and cited information can be found on www.phildonnellypt.com Thank you for listening and take care.